You are live, Your Honor. All right, thank you, James. All right, folks, I'd like to call this evening's public hearing to order. The um, purpose of this evening, I'm trying to find my public notice. We're gonna start off with um, the purpose of this meeting. I'm sorry, you guys, I'm struggling with my, there it is. Um, is to discuss the uh, or ordinance uh, amendment or addition of the Permanent Public Building Committee, Project Committee. Um, there it is, Permanent Municipal, I wanted to get the wording right, thank you, James. Permanent Municipal Building Commission Ordinance Amendment. And this is an opportunity for any member of the public to comment and express their views on the amendment to Chapter 8, Boards, Committees, Commissions, and Bureaus, Article 12, Permanent Municipal Building Commission. Um, I will say that we've had a number of emails sent in to us uh, for consideration for this meeting. And our rules of procedure, Town Council rules of procedure, do not specifically state how we would handle that in um in the public hearing setting, our rules really only speak to the regular meeting and special meeting settings. Um, so I'm gonna suggest that we handle those emails the same way we would in one of those meetings, which would be, you know what, James, can you chime in for me? Cause I know you've reviewed the rules. Um, should we be listing the names as we would in a regular meeting here or would it make more sense to do that during the regular meeting afterward? If they were uh, requesting that they be read in the public hearing, we could still attach those to the same set of minutes. That wouldn't be a problem. Okay. And I do that was my inclination, uh, given that the, it's not specifically addressed, but by virtue of the intention of the council rules of procedure, I would look around at the counselors that are present to give me a shake of the head. The way we would typically do that is to read the names of who wrote in, and that would be attached to the minutes. Are we all in agreement on that, folks? I would agree. We definitely have a consensus. Okay. Um, it's just a kind of a um, weird situation where it's not specifically addressed. I want to make sure we're in agreement. Okay. So um, I will start with those that are present in the meeting with us this evening. Oh, I'm sorry, Carol. Go ahead. That's okay. I just have a question. If someone wrote a letter and they're online to speak live, if they speak live, well, then their letter would not be attached. Am I correct? Or one? That is correct. correct. One, after one, one or the other. Yes, right. that is. So if you can let people know that. Okay. Great idea. So I do see some names in the attendee side of our meeting that did send in emails. So just so you know, if you're an attendee and you choose to speak during public participation on this item, um, then your letter would not be attached because you only get to the opportunity to speak once by council rules of procedure. Um, so I just thank you, Councilor Annis, for pointing that out. As All a right, secondary so point to that, they would still have the option under the regular meeting to yes. either read or speak, have that read or spoke. Perfect. Thank you, James. You're welcome. All right. The first member of the public that I see with their hand raised is Leanne Mankey. And if, as you're speaking, folks, please remember to state your name and address for the record. Uh, Leanne Weatherall Mankey, 112 Northwood Road. Uh, okay. I, I wish to address the proposed ordinance for a permanent municipal building commission. I want to state that in theory, I think this concept is an excellent idea. Over the years, I've served on several building committees, both for the town as well as my professional experience in the construction industry. When committee members have building knowledge and experience, the work of the group progresses in a more efficient and professional manner. It doesn't have to reinvent the wheel, so to speak, to bring less informed members up to speed. A permanent committee will lend itself to continuity and overall municipal facility improvements. That said, I do have several concerns with the proposal as presented. Please know that as I address these items, I mean no disrespect to the individual serving on this town council, the current town manager, and any potential commission member candidates. They say the road to hell is paved with good intentions. My concern lies with the fact that the current intent of this body for the proposed ordinance is not necessarily reflected in the specific language and leaves a great deal of room for broad interpretation. Over the years to come, the town councilors will be elected and then leave office, staffing of the town manager will change, commission appointees will come and go. This ordinance will have to stand the test of time and will be the only permanent guidance in the future. I have several issues with the proposed composition of this body. The proposal calls for five members, three appointed by the town manager and one each appointed by the two major political parties. Only the town manager appointments are required to have construction and building qualifications. 
The political appointments only require political affiliation. This is in complete discord with the proposed intent of having qualified individuals serve. The commission as proposed established in essence a super committee, a body that has significant power with limited supervision. By having the town manager appoint membership, the town council has shifted its responsibility to a town employee. This imbues the uh, town manager position, which already operates as the town chief executive officer with significantly more power. Again, I have a great deal of respect and admiration for Mr. Chapman, but there have been and could be again a town manager who could potentially abuse this power. It also puts this commission one step beyond the town council control and in turn even farther away from average taxpayer and voter control. I question the membership of the committee regarding the ex officio membership by town council and various department heads proposing body representatives. Speaking from my previous building committees and professional experience, I can attest to having a very good understanding of the commercial and industrial building trades, as well as some municipal and education facility work. But my expertise does not replace the input from those individuals with boots on the ground. I believe that the department proposing body should have more than an advisory role on its own project, including a vote. The current proposed makeup lends itself to an additional cost in hiring of outside consultants for a specific facility type, education, public safety, et cetera. And when we have the talent in our own town on staff or volunteer who are the ultimate end users of the facility. This commission is for the building projects that would occur in town owned facilities. The Lucy Robbins Wells Library facility and property is not municipally owned, but is privately owned by the Board of Trustees Corporation. As established by the 1939 charter and agreement, the town of Newington is required to main increase and grow the library. While the library has committed to providing the town with a library facility that is open to all residents and free of charge. Therefore, the operation of the library and its facilities and property are independent of town authority, and any changes to the library will continue to be the responsibility of the Board of Trustees and should not be within the jurisdiction of the proposed commission. Another mechanism for future library projects would be required. I suggest that the town council table this proposal and revisit these and other specifics that are currently outlined. Perhaps creation of a core membership that would provide the stability and continuity that has the intent with the addition of membership by individual project to supplement that core membership. Qualifications should be required of all core members, political appointments included. More town council oversight of the appointment process as well as building committee power versus what could very easily devolve into a rubber stamp by the town council and creation of a very powerful super committee. The concept is excellent, but the plan definitely needs to go back to the drawing board. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Mankey. All right, the next hand up is Neil J. Ryan. Okay, I'm unmuted. Am I coming through? Yes, you are. Good evening, Neil Ryan, 237 Brockett Street, the heart of Newington. I wanna briefly discuss the proposed Permanent Facilities Commission. My first point is ask why this proposal, which I consider an extensive proposal, doesn't require a charter revision. Uh, my second point is to ask why is such a far reaching proposal being acted upon now? Anyone who knows anything about this Republican town council and town manager knows what this proposal is about. I assume once this permanent facilities commission is voted into existence, its first move will be to disband the Anna Reynolds Renovation Building Committee, the Lucy Robbins Wells Library, also as a building and expansion committee in, in existence. It's been on hold for several years, but is, is still in existence. I imagine that committee, committee will also be disbanded. From the very beginning, this Republican town council and town manager have been opposed to the Anna Reynolds renovation project. They have never wanted it to move forward. At his budget presentation in March of this year, our town manager publicly stated that he was opposed to the Anna Reynolds project moving forward. He described it as being a want on the part of the town rather than a need. This from someone who hasn't set foot into the school in more than 20 years. This individual deliberately avoided a press conference with Governor Lamont two weeks ago at the Anna Reynolds School where the governor highlighted the need for the project. Apparently the town manager is also unaware of the Anna Reynolds renovation referendum vote that was held last November on election day. At that, point, at that uh, time, 70% of the voters voted to support the Anna Reynolds renovation project. That should have been the end of the discussion. The Anna Reynolds renovation building committee should be moving along at full speed now. But this town manager, town council are apparently attempting to throw another roadblock in front of it. 
Now, the composition. I would I would remind you that this public hearing is to discuss the permanent building committee, and that is the topic at hand. Please. That, that's what I'm discussing. The commission shall consist of five voting members, three of which shall be qualified because of their experience in the field of architecture, landscape architecture, building construction, and building trades. Now, it, they also they're required to be electors at the town anointed, which is a nice touch. Um, seeing that the the, um, the three appointees from the town manager, the town manager is not a, is not an elector of anointed, and hasn't been in years. Um, but the thing is. Um, the thing is that the town manager is making decisions that have an impact on everyone who lives in Newington, except, of course, for himself, since he refuses to move to Newington as the town charter requires. Contract. I'm sorry, what? No, let's stay in order, please. I know it's frustrating sometimes we have to stay in order. Continue, Mr. Ryan. You got to listen. Now, it's also noted that three of the appointments should be qualified because of their experience in the fields of architecture, landscape architecture, building construction, building trades. Who exactly is going to make the determination as to whether the three appointments have the necessary experience in the fields of architecture, landscape architecture, building construction, or building trades? Will the town manager be making that call? Is he an experienced architect mm -hmm. who is working landscape architecture, building construction, or the building trades? Right now, I believe the chair of the Anne Reynolds Renovation Committee is Steve Woods, who has a wealth of work experience in the field of architecture, landscape architecture, building construction, and the building trades. I can't see where any of the proposed three new appointments will have anywhere near that amount of experience. Also, the chair of the Library Building Expansion Committee, which is still in existence, is Newell Stam. Again, someone with a wealth of work experience in the field of architecture, landscape architecture, building construction, building trades. Now, this proposed new commission, I don't see where it's going to prove anything going forward for the town. It's really a step backwards. Um, that doesn't seem to bother the town manager or the public of the town council. I assume they're going to vote tonight to put this uh, commission into existence. And that's it. Thanks for your time. All right, folks, let me just click over to the next person. And the next person is Miss Rose Lyons. Welcome, Rose. Hi, it's Rose Lyons, 46 Elton Drive. Um, as someone who has sat through at least four different town hall reno committees and also was in attendance with them as the, uh, there was three different or two different town managers. And actually, I guess there's three because they're still meeting and Mr. Chapman attends those meetings, I believe. And there was two different facilities managers. I welcome the thought of a permanent building committee. However, I do have some concerns and reservations, as does Leanne Mankey, but she has um, made her points and stated them well as far as I'm concerned, so I will uh, just say that I agree with what she had to say. I do believe that um, the committee could be repealed or revoked or disbanded by disbanding the ordinance or re Appealing the ordinance. So once again, we're going to have an ordinance that is going to go into effect, but if another party comes into control two or three years from now or four years from now, they could decide to just be done with it. Um, I just think that the ordinance maybe needs a little bit more thought to it. Uh, I do want to thank uh, Mayor Del Buno for reaching out to me and trying to give me some information as far as public participation at a public hearing. I understand the process with the town council and it is clear in my mind as far as that goes, but as far as public hearings, I know that you can only speak to what the public hearing is on. I don't know if you have to have, or you even can have your letters or emails entered into the record unless you specifically say you want it read into the record of the public hearing. It seems that each public hearing, the public participation rules vary. So I just like some clear cut direction going forward for other public hearings as to how it's actually handled. That being said, I hope there'll be more discussion tonight and it won't be passed until there's a little bit more clarification and discussion amongst all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lyons. 
Um, so procedurally, folks, uh, just bear with me for a second. We do have two public hearings scheduled this evening, and we should have swapped the order of them. We did not. Um, when it was posted uh, by the town clerk's office, it was posted as the second one would start at 650, which we are already over that. So that being said, what I would like to do is put this public hearing in recess. So everyone on, stay put. We are not stopping. We just have to press pause on this meeting to call to order a public hearing for land acquisition fund. If there's anyone on the call that would like to speak to that, you can raise your hand. So those of you that have your hands raised right now, I'm gonna write the order down. Uh, Amy, Brian, you took your hands down really quickly. I'm sorry, I didn't get everybody. Um, but I will, I promise we will get right back to you. The land acquisition fund um, public meeting. So we stand in recess for the public hearing on the municipal building committee. We are going to now call to order. I'm calling to order the public hearing to address the land acquisition fund ordinance amendment that is proposed. We are proposing to set a minimum amount of funding to be budgeted each year into that fund of $10,000 is the current language that is proposed. And so if your hand is up in the attendees window right now, it is to speak on the land acquisition fund public hearing. And I will go back, I promise, to the rest of you for the other topic. Okay, Ms. Lyons. Hi, Rose Lyons, 46 Elton Drive again. On this particular ordinance, I'm very happy to see that you're going to put some dollar amount and give it some teeth. Over the years, I have looked at it as I was going through the budget and the formula was a little bit confusing and I think that you'll all agree on that. I am a firm believer in the town should be putting money aside to uh, acquire land. Unfortunately, it's never been addressed in the past. So um, I am just speaking in favor of this ordinance. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. All right, any other member of the public that is wishing to speak uh, uh, for the public hearing regarding land acquisition fund ordinance amendment? If your hand is up, I will call on you right now. There is no one with their hand up, so I'll give it just a minute to see if anyone else chooses to participate in this public hearing. All right, there is no member of the public with their hand raised at this point. Um, James, did we have any email correspondence requesting it be read in for the land acquisition fund public hearing? Uh, none that I was made aware of, Your Honor. Okay, I did not see any either, thank you. All right, that being said, then I will close the public hearing for land acquisition. We will go back into the previous public hearing for the permanent municipal building committee um, that was in recess. And I will look for those who had their hands raised I know I had Amy Parati, so I'm going to allow um, her to talk first because I know she was in there first before we went to our meeting. All right, hi, am I unmuted? Hi. Yep. Okay, great, thank you. Um, Amy Parati. Zoe, hold on a second. <laughs> Sorry, Amy Parati, 175 Hillcrest Avenue. Um, I did write a letter, but I'll just read it. Um, I'm just wanting to say that I'm not in favor of the permanent building commission as laid out in the proposed update. Having the town manager appoint three out of five committee members takes away the opportunity to have the voters have a voice by electing the council members and choosing the appointees. I disagree with the town council giving up the authority to appoint members to a the building commission. The town manager is not an elected official of the town. And while he may have experience and knowledge that the council can use as guidance, he should not be responsible for having the final say in who is appointed to the building commission. Take for example, the Anna Reynolds building committee formed in May of 2019 by the town council and under the current charter language. As far as I've heard, both sides are happy with the formation of this committee. Um, it's made up of seven members. Several members have construction experience, architecture experience. Um, there's an IT professional and representation from the people who are in the school and understand the needs on a personal level. There are two board of ed members elected by the voters who are also able to represent the requesting agency, two town council members elected by the voters and, sorry, and uh, 
and three community members who were excellent appointees given their background and interest in the project. This committee is well-rounded and 2019 Town Council was able to make these appointments under the current charter. I can understand the appeal of a permanent building committee and having members with construction experience. However, there are other things that members of the community can bring to various projects who don't necessarily have that professional experience um, in their resume. I also have an issue with only these five appointees being voting members. A person representing the requesting agency is allowed to be ex officio member, but everyone knows if you don't have a vote, you don't really have a voice. Think about future projects this town may take on. There could be additional school renovations, expanding the library, firehouses, et cetera. With the town manager appointing the majority of the members and no representation from those agencies, will we really end up with the best possible outcome? So in closing, the proposed charter, the change as written does not reflect the best interests of the town. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Parati. And have a good evening, Zoe. <laughs> All right, next up with their hand up is uh, Mr. Helvey. Oh, Hi, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Um, I'll keep it quick. You, you know, everyone on the council already uh, received an email from me. Um, and, you know, I, I think Amy did a really wonderful job kind of laying out a lot of the concerns. You Mr. know, I Hulk, think- are you, are you, I just want to make sure you were on earlier when I said, if you wrote a letter in, it's one or the other. Are you preferring to do the verbal? Yeah, I'm, I'm fine with doing the verbal. That's okay. okay. Um, Thank you. you know, in short, what I, what I would ultimately look at is I think there's, there's benefit to the proposal, but not as it's written. You know, I think having additional experts with background in the field of construction, development, project management, these are great things to include in the discussion around project uh, committees. That's a great thing, no argument there. I think the concern for me is the way in which this proposal is written, which I believe other speakers already addressed. Um, you know, the idea that the appointing authority is housed with one individual who's not an elected official. That concerns me, especially given Mr. Helby, we lost you. Are you still there? Oh, can you hear me okay? Yes, that's better. Oh, sorry. So I think, you know, it's important for us to maintain that ability to have our town council appointing the members, as Amy pointed out and others have pointed out, having a variety of different voices at the table is going to be really important. I think, you know, we really need to look at the way that this proposal is written to ensure that it's truly representative and that you know, our, the requesting agencies have that vote. As Amy pointed out, you know, if, if they don't have a vote, then their seat in the table doesn't really matter. It's about giving teeth to every person that they can kind of chew in and, and participate. So I, I would strongly urge the members of the town council not, not to toss the notion of a permanent committee, but to really heavily revise the motion as it's currently written, give it some time, public vet it, and then reconsider this moving forward. But as it's written, I don't believe that this motion serves our town in the best possible way. Thanks very much. Have a great evening. Thank you, Mr. Helby, you as well. Next is Brian Haggerty. Good evening, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Uh, Brian Haggerty, 529 Fen Road. Um, I think the idea is a great concept. Uh, I think it invents lack of a better word, uh, a level of continuity uh, with town projects that does not exist. Uh, I think equally as important, it preserves public input, uh, which is equally as crucial. I think any time that uh, you can consolidate and pool knowledge and resources, you always have better outcomes. Uh, and conversely, when you fragment data, knowledge and resource, you, you, you don't have uh, equal as good outcomes. Um, you know, I think it does need some work uh, with who's picking who and, and who goes where, but overall, I think it's a great concept uh, and certainly should be continued to be talked about. And that's my input. Great. Thank you, Mr. Haggerty. <clears throat> okay. I have one more hand that just went up. Uh, it's Diane. Hi, um, Diane Stam, 104 Steeplechase Drive, Newington, Connecticut. I 
wasn't quite clear what was going on with the rules, I did send in a letter um, to the mayor and the town council on the building commission, and I would like that to be part of the minutes. So I, I appreciate that. Okay, so you're gonna choose that as your public participation this evening? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you, Ms. Dam. All right, I'm just gonna give it another minute in case anyone else wants to raise their hand. Again, we are still continuing in the public hearing regarding the uh, Municipal Building Committee ordinance that was proposed. All right, I do not, oh, one more hand just went up. Joe? Joe no, Harpy. 36 Baldwin Court, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, I read this um, over the last couple of, well, today I read it in great detail. There's a lot to uh, take in, but after spending five years on a committee, I can tell you um, it takes a lot of commitment on the part of volunteers. And um, I don't think we lose the volunteer commitment given the fact uh, that the council or a working majority of the council would like to see the creation of this committee. I think the benefit of this commission is, as you all know, you have uh, received a report from your consultant on a number of properties that both town assets and those of the educational system that are gonna require a lot of attention over the next 10 years or more. And I've read that one, that's a very comprehensive one, a little scary in terms of cost on some of the situations. But I think this is the best platform to deal with those under maintenance as described uh, in the proposal. Because otherwise it would get out of control very rapidly and very quickly, I think, in terms of what project you go to next in terms of building maintenance of the stock of buildings that we already have. And I think this is a comprehensive approach to it. Not perfect, but a good solid approach to taking care of those situations and to schedule them in an orderly process that's affordable to the town of Newington and its residents. Now, there was a much discussion about uh, the curtailment of other people's thoughts and ideas on committees existing or past, but this, this proposal includes, <clears throat> excuse me, it includes a section uh, for proposing body or agencies that bring these to the forefront as a need, whether it's parks and rec, whether it's the school system, whatever, whatever area it's in, the proposing agency has responsibilities and they have to kind of square it up. They have to do a quick analysis of cost uh, a needs set assessment in there. So they're gonna do a lot of work and continue to do lifting on getting these projects to the commission so that the commission can view them and bring them to the council. But the entry level, the entry level of any commission and agency is quite low. You bring it to the committee, uh, you bring it to the council and the council says, what's the needs assessment? You kind of do a quick and dirty review of that and then it's, onto the race to see if it can become a reality. So I think the democratic democracy part of this is still in play. I understand people's concerns about who's appointing who, but I think on, on a whole from the ones that I dealt, dealt with when I was with the Connecticut Development Authority for the state, and we had responsibility for 169 towns. There were a number of towns that had this approach and it didn't collapse, it didn't implode. Uh, it took work, it took some correction, mid-year corrections uh, that are always required. But I think to try to find volunteers for the maintenance section at any point in time is a real stretch. I think a lot of people have been stretched. It's the same people typically that volunteer for everything. Um, and you like to increase that pool at some point. But I think this framework is a good paradigm and a good platform for moving forward. So in short, um, based on my experience as chairman of the project building committee for the town hall um, and other things that I've done in my personal life, 
I recommend that the council move forward on this. Thank you very much, ma'am. Thank you, Mr. Harpy. Okay, folks. I have no other hands up in our attendees window. So I am calling this public hearing closed. All right, we are closed for the public hearing. Um, I would recommend a five minute uh, quick recess uh, before heading into the regular council meeting. So if you are off camera, you can feel free to turn your cameras off and make sure your mute mics are muted if you are going to take the five minute recess folks.
All right, folks, are we all there? I'll wait till everybody has their cameras back on so I know everybody's present. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I don't see Councillor Minor. Is he? Did he get booted out somehow? Does anybody yeah, else see Chris? I don't see him, but I think he got kicked out. I don't know what happened to him. Carol, do you want to just text him and let him know we're calling order again so he knows? I shall. Him? Thank you. <laughs> All right, folks, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, I would like to call to order our Newington Town Council regular meeting for Tuesday, September 14th. We're calling to order at 7.18 p.m. following the public hearings that we just had. If you would please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance, allegiance to the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, yeah. one, nation, one nation, under God, yeah. indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. We will move into roll call, please. Councillor Annist. Councillor Braverman. Councillor Braverman, you're on mute. Yes, here. Councillor Budraco. Councilor Budraco? Here. Councilor Camillo? Here. 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 Councilor Donahue? Here. Councilor Mankey? Here. Councilor Minor? Here. Councilor Nagel? Here. Mayor Del Buno? Here. All right, everyone is present. Thank you. And we are now going to look for approval of the agenda. I understand that we may be looking to move. We have an introduction of two of our town um, employees, new introductions for our fire marshal and facilities director. Um, and I'm wondering if someone would make a motion to move those two items uh, to the beginning of old business prior to the health update of COVID-19. So moved. Second. Second. Thank you, moved by Council Mackey, seconded by Council Annist. Is there any discussion on changing that? Okay, are there any other changes recommended? All right, hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously, thank you. Uh, next on our agenda is awards and proclamations. This evening we have a proclamation celebrating Constitution Week 2021. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and read this in for us. Proclamation Constitution Week. Whereas the Constitution of the United States of America, the guardian of our liberties, embodies the principles of limited government in a republic dedicated to rule by law. And whereas September 17th, 2021 marks the 234th anniversary of the drafting of the Constitution of the United States of America, by the Constitutional Convention. And whereas it is fitting and proper to accord official recognition to this magnificent document and its memorable anniversary and to the patriotic celebrations which will commemorate the occasion. And whereas public law 915 guarantees the issuing of a proclamation each year by the President of the United States of America designating September 17th through the 23rd as Constitution Week. Now, therefore, I, Beth Del Buno, by by virtue of the authority vested in me as mayor of the town of Newington, do hereby proclaim the week of September 17th through 23rd as Constitution Week and ask our citizens to reaffirm the ideals the framers of the Constitution had in 1787 by vigilantly protecting the freedoms guaranteed to us through this guardian of our liberties. In witness thereof, I have hereunto set my hand and caused the seal of the town to be affixed this 14th day of September of the year of our Lord 2021 Signed, Mayor Beth Del Buno. Is there a second? Second. second? 
Thank you, Councilor Mankey. Is there yes. any discussion? I will say that a member of the public had reached out to me uh, to consider this uh, proclamation and we did do one uh, last year um, to commemorate the Constitution Week. Um, and so I felt it um, fitting to do it again this year. And this is language that was provided, um, you know, nationally, they use this language to recognize it. Councilor Annis? Hey, I just wanna um, bring up that to, uh, 34 years ago, when we had the Constitution um, Committee for the 200th year celebration, um, that the square, and there used to be a sign there that was dedicated. So I don't know if something could be resurrected that maybe a, a sign could be put there once again, but that was named, dedicated as Constitution Square parking lot after, because of the 200th anniversary of the Constitution. So. That's a great point. <laughs> It would be nice Mr. to Chapman. be able to have that sign back. Mr. Chairman, could you look into that in terms of the history and perhaps looking to do that again? Yeah, Esther Eddy was the chairman of the um, committee, the commission. Matter of fact, I have a flag that I'd be willing to, to donate that was purchased back then. Okay, yeah, I will take care of it and uh, report back. Okay. Great. Thank you, Councilor Ernest. Thank you, Mr. Chapman. Any other council comment? All right, seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 I saw, Mr. Miner, did you, I didn't hear you, I'm sorry. Yes, I. Thank you. Any opposed? All right, motion passes. Thank you, everyone. The next item on our agenda this evening is public participation. Any member of the public may participate for four minutes is our time limit. Um, we. Um, I will start out this public participation session by saying that uh, in error at the previous public hearing, we um, meant to mention into the record the names of those that sent in letters to be read. Um, they will be attached to the minutes of the public hearing. So I will quickly read the names or actually, James, are you on with us? Do you have that list? I do, Your Honor. I Could you go ahead and let us know who sent in letters uh, to be attached? Certainly. Thank you. I have Danielle Droz. I have Roy Zartarian, Michael Branda, Walter Bradell, Kim Rada, Kent Stoddard, Chris Riley, John Trister, Mitch Page, Mary Beatrice, Andrew Brecker, Sam Sharma, and Diane Stam. Thank you. I had the same list. Did anybody else see any um, omissions on that? Do not. Okay. All right. So those are the people that did send in emails and ask that they be attached. So we will attach those to the public hearing for the Municipal uh, Building Commission. And I'd like to thank Councillor Minor, uh, Councillor Mankey for that list assistance. No problem. <laughs> All right. All right. So now we're going to move on to public participation related to this meeting. And I see first and foremost, Ms. Lyons has her hand up. So we'll go ahead and recognize her. Hi, Rose Lyons, 46 Elton Drive. Um, I hate to beat a dead horse, but, and I will preface this with, I didn't get a vote back when the town council rules were changed, and I don't expect I'll get a vote on this, but um, the town council rules on public participation, to the best of my recollection, were, char were changed prior to COVID meetings. And since then, for the past year and a half, year, and it looks like maybe going forward another six months, most meetings are going to be held on Zoom. Now, I didn't like the idea of the emails and letters not being read into the record, just being attached to the minutes back then, and I certainly don't like the idea now. I think that if people take the time to write a letter or send an email, um, that their voices should be heard. When you had the public hearing on the Anna Reynolds referendum, the, rec the letters and the emails were read into the record. When these people send in the emails and the letters, do they ask that they be attached to the minutes or do they ask that they be read into the record? It just is very confusing. And I 
as much as I like hearing the people that wrote in, I'd like to hear whether they were in favor of or against the particular issue. I just think that there has to be some sort of standard set. Uh, most often, there's very few people participating at these meetings, me being one and maybe Susan Mazzacoli and a few others. But um, I don't think it is asking too much that they be read in, especially when some of us sit and listen to you go on for hours and hours about different things. And we sit in, we hang in, and I think that the least you can do is show the consideration to read them into the record, not just attach them and let somebody have to go look at the minutes two weeks from now or a month from now. That being said, just quickly, I'd like to ask when we're going to get an update on uh, the various projects around town. I see things on Facebook regarding the rotary on Fen Road, people questioning the Main and Robbins intersection, the Robbins and Maple Hill project, the sidewalk connect on Main Street to Lewis Street. Um, also, I noticed in the Parks and Rec minutes that they are looking for a grant for $50,000 for either a pavilion or a gazebo in the municipal parking lot. The cost is going to be $158,000, and they're looking to businesses to make up the difference between the grant if they get it. I know we have a grant writer coming on board. I'm just wondering if that person or the firm will be coming before the town council to make them aware of what they will be applying for and what the cost might be for the town, if any. The other thing was the 690 Cedar Street project was uh, discussed and approved at a meeting at the TPZ, and one resident uh, voiced concern about having not enough information about it, and they were told that it was discussed at the town council level for at least a year, and they shouldn't be concerned about uh, the, the short time that they had on TPZ to address it. I guess I must have missed those meetings, but in any case, the other thing I'd like to ask is um, whether there will be any updates on economic development, uh, just, you know, Tom, I mean, not Tom, by like Keeney Manufacturing, I've been looking at that, and maybe it's been addressed and I've missed it. And thank you for the announcement of a shredding event. There's a lot of uh, building committee notes that I'm going to be so delighted to have thrown into that shredder along with a few others. And uh, last but not least, good luck with the Constitution Square uh, sign search because uh, we've been looking for it for about 10 years now. It's missing in action. Thank you again. I'll be listening and catch you at the end. Good night. Thank you, Ms. Lyons. All right. All right, I don't see any other hands up in our attendees window, so we will move on now to remarks by counselors on public participation. Councilor Camillo. Economic development. I know we've got about 230 million in the works at the moment, and there may be another 170 coming down the road. And this, this is something that hasn't happened in, ever, as far as I, I can remember, all at once. And uh, we can thank our town employees and Keith Chapman for that. Um, I read something the other day that uh, Andy Brecker had something to do with this, and, and he hasn't. Not a single developer has mentioned his name or ever, ever met him. So um, when you read that flyer, please, uh, you know, know that it's been corrected and uh keith and your town administrators thank you um can i talk about the um the ordinance this is related to the public participation so whatever miss lyons mentioned okay thank you all right thank you Councilor mankey yeah just let just let everybody know i'll add the uh, um update on our projects to our our agenda items to talk about about it next agenda setting. Makes sense. Thank you. And perhaps we could also add to agenda it's uh, an update on the grant writing to see if they want to at least give us a provide in writing a list of something doing, that it, doing it as we speak. Thank you. Councilor Minor. Thank you. Just to clarify uh, Councilor Camillo's comments. The council during 2019 was briefed as well as 2018 
on the Grossman project, as well as the hotel project on Cedar Street. I am not going to take away from the current administration closing the deals out, which they did, and I applaud them for their efforts. But I just want the public to understand that projects of the scope and size do not develop over a six month or a one year time frame. And that's evident to Cedar Mountain with the development that never came to fruition. So I just want to clarify that. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we will move on now uh, to consideration of old business. And we did move to the front of this, uh, the introduction of our two uh, new members of our staff. So Mr. Chapman, uh, first on the docket is the introduction of Fire Marshal uh, Douglas Zordon. Would you like to go ahead and do that for us? Uh, certainly, uh, uh, DJ, as we call him, uh, Doug Zordon is uh, new to the town. He's been here for maybe a month or two. Uh, and he's done a wonderful job at this point. He's building a team of uh, deputy fire marshals. And uh, uh, if you've been by, well, you wouldn't be by the office because the town hall's closed, but his office is in disarray right now. There are files everywhere that he's, he's going through, cleaning out. Uh, very, very happy with uh, Doug being on board. And, and keep in mind, this is a, a selection by the fire commissioner. So I, I uh, interviewed him but the appointment comes through the fire commissioners. And I believe that uh, we all, all three fire commissioners and I all supported the hiring of Doug. And, and uh, I, I think that in, uh, in the long run, we're gonna find that he's gonna work extremely well with the staff that's already on board, as well as the next uh, person you're gonna introduce, which is Joe. They, uh, we're getting some great people in now. And uh, I just see it as a real plus for the town. So we're happy to have uh, as they call DJ on board. Great. Welcome, DJ. Oh, DJ. DJ, I know I, I had the pleasure of meeting you at a fire uh, department function, um, but the rest of the council hadn't gotten to meet you, so we're glad you were able to join us tonight. Do you want to give us a quick um, one-two about where you're coming from and what you'd uh, like to do for us? What you see? Yeah, certainly. Can you, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Um, so good evening. Uh, happy to be here tonight. Uh, I did have the opportunity to meet um, a few of the counselors through the extravaganza in July and um, through the swearing in um, ceremony at the firehouse. But um, I'm grateful for the opportunity to, uh, to work in Newington. Um, it's, um, I've been busy, I can say that much. Um, the team, you know, that was in place prior to me starting um, had done a great job, you know, uh, keeping things together. Um, and we've been working extremely well. Um, we did bring on, um, or I should say we replaced a deputy fire marshal, um, already, uh, because, uh, one had resigned and it's, um, it's going well, but I'm definitely looking forward to supporting the community, working with, uh, the, the various town departments. Um, we've, we've done that. We've, there's been a lot of collaboration, um, to really streamline the office. Um, our, um, you know, our main goals are to provide the service that, um, developers need, you know, for construction projects, for um, renovations. Um, and then obviously we've been supporting the fire department. Um, so um, again, I'm happy to be here. And if there's anything that I can ever do, you're all welcome to, uh, to call uh, when town hall reopens, certainly stop by. We'd be happy to, uh, to visit with you guys. Great. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, counselors, do you have any comment or question? I heard a few well, welcomes, right? <laughs> welcome aboard. Welcome. Great. Yeah, Mr. Chapman has been, I, I shouldn't tell you this, but he's been saying some pretty nice things about you and uh, how pleased he is with having you on board. So uh, <laughs> we're really glad <laughs> to have you. That's, that's good to hear. Thank you. Great. Thank you. All right, folks, we're going to move on to our next introduction, who is uh, Joe, Joe Salamone. And I'll save Mr. Chapman the trouble. He keeps, every time he mentions his name, he says, no relation to our previous town manager. So, <laughs> uh, Mr. Chapman, do you want to go ahead and introduce Joe? Thank you for, for announcing that. I don't have to this time. Uh, yes, uh, Joe has been with us uh, less time than, than uh, DJ. However, he's making a big impression already with the... Uh, uh, overall, uh, as you recall, Paul Boutat has been doing double duty for the last year or more, and uh, uh, Joe's a welcome addition to our staff. I, I know Joe from previous employment, 
and he is top notch. Uh, I think you'll find him to be a real professional. And uh, I, I'm looking forward. He's going to be he, he uh, as well as well. I'll get into that later. But he'll you'll be seeing uh, him in October uh, at a meeting. Uh, so. I'm just pleased that these new hires are going to be fantastic. And the Joe and DJ are two of those people. So Joe, you're, you may say whatever you want at this point. Any, nothing bad about me though. <laughs> anything but that. Well, like, uh, like DJ, I'm very uh, happy and excited to be with the town of Newington. Uh, it's a great community. Some great professionals that I've met and been working with so far since I've been here. Haven't had the opportunity to meet uh, any of the counselors in person yet. Um, but again, my phone is open and, and when the town hall is, you know, returns to, to some pre-COVID normalcy, uh, I look forward to meeting all of you as well. Um, hit the ground running. There's a lot to do. Paul did a great job trying to steer the ship, um, had a lot of balls in the air. Um, and, and, and same thing with uh, Gary, the town engineer prior to Paul. Um, I've been working hard on trying to dissect and digest all of the Owens reports. There's a lot of information there. Um, and like Keith said, we'll be talking about that further in the October meeting, um, working on streamlining and um, standardizing some of our policies and procedures that weren't really formalized for the facilities department. And I think that's going to be beneficial moving forward. Um, so again, I'm happy to be here. Um, great group of people that I'm working with, and uh, I look forward to meeting all of you in the, in the future as well. Great. Thank you and welcome. Councilors, any comment or question? Uh, Deputy Mayor Bedraco. Um, yeah, Joe, did they tell you there's going to be a pop quiz on the Owens report tonight? <laughs> Page 522. Yeah. Even if they did, I'm not sure I'd be able to, to, to handle it. Well, welcome. I'm sure you're, I'm sure in the long run, you're going to be able to uh, work your way through it and, and help us out. So welcome. Yes. Absolutely. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Welcome yeah, we really are again. looking forward to getting into that with you and uh, seeing how we can best move forward so many of the projects that are in front of us. So uh, welcome, and uh, we don't envy you at all for having to digest all of that, but we appreciate you. <laughs> Thank you very all much. Right. Thank you. Anyone else? All right, great. Thank you. All right, we'll move on now to the uh, first, uh, well, the next item under, COVID, under old business, which is the health update regarding COVID-19. Mr. Chapman? Yes, as you uh, were notified uh, last Thursday afternoon, uh, we are now back in the orange, which means we're in better shape in the town of Newington than we were the week earlier when we were in the red. However, we're right on the border of between orange and red, and I, we're going to take the position that um, we'll make this the, the, the worst case scenario assumption that we'll, we'll be back in the red after this Thursday. However, if that doesn't occur, then uh, we'll, we'll continue to do what we're doing now. You know, the town hall is basically closed to the public. However, they are uh, able to come in and do their business. They have to go through a screening process at the uh, main entrance to the town hall. Uh, they are escorted through the town hall in the upper floors and they have to sign in and then sign out and fill out the proper paperwork. So if anyone needs to come to the town hall, for business, they are still welcome, but there is a process. The only door the public can come in is the main entrance down in the lower level uh, opposite the police department and, uh, building. So um, we're gonna continue assuming that we're gonna be right on that border between orange and, and red. If we, if we ever get back to yellow, uh, certainly that will free up a lot of activities, but uh, Charlie Brown from the health district is working closely with uh, Megan and uh, members of our staff to make sure that we do as much as we can to protect the public. Uh, there are a lot of events that have been scheduled uh, that we're going to continue to move forward with now that we're back in orange. Uh, and uh, I think that, you know, if we continue to require the distance uh, and the masks, uh, we should be as safe as possible. Um, but we'll see how it goes and hopefully we stay in the orange and not go back in the red. Great, thank you. Council Mankey. So I just want to reiterate, if, if the public needs to access the, build, access the building, they can still do so. They just have to go through the process uh, like you do in any 
you know, I had to go to the, the doctor's appointment. I had to say it's the same basic process, the same questions, same writing, in and out, signing in and out. So, but they can still access the building if they have business. That's correct. Thank you. Thank you. Just to clarify, uh, Keith, on the way the process is now, the weekly report is issued on Thursday. What's the current procedure as it's set up now in terms of when do we go to whatever color designation there is? Is it the following week or should we reassess and say we're going to have two weeks before we change or how exactly uh, do we keep this going as we move into the fall and possibility uh, of getting more more cases? Uh, certainly it will be at least two weeks of a consistent color, whether it be yellow, orange or red to make any change from what we're currently doing. Um, you know, the, 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 because right now we are right on the border between orange and red, we're, we're operating in the, as if we're in the red, even though we're in the orange, because the difference is very, very minimal anyway when it comes to access to the town buildings. If we do get back in the yellow, we'll say this Thursday, if we could possibly, we will not respond to that yellow until a second yellow shows up the following week. So we're not going to rapidly jump into changing the way we're doing things. We wanna take, take the time and make sure that whatever color we're in, we remain in that color and moving forward, hopefully we, the numbers will grow further apart so we stay within whatever color we're in. So right mm -hmm. now it's at least a two week uh, consistent color before any consideration would be made to change. So we're still considered to be in the red. We will find out this Thursday if, if we have another orange, then again, there's not a lot of difference between orange and red when it comes to the town building. Uh, so not much will change if anything. Um, but if we get back to yellow, then that will free things up, but it will have to be a multitude of, of you know, at least two yellows consistently. Okay, so we're just gonna go moving forward with the premise of two reporting weeks, two consecutive reporting weeks that have basically got two weeks data each before we make any changes one way or the other. That's correct, that's correct. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Minor. Councilor Nagel. Uh, I just wanted to add that uh, I had a need to go into town hall during the, the present uh, rules and regulations for a lack of anything else. It was very simple, very easy. The staff was very courteous. It's filling out a simple form, signing it, saying what department you need to go to, make certain you have a mask, and uh, then you're sent uh, on your way with approval. And when you leave, you simply have to say that you move left and they sign out. So it's, it's not a scary situation or a difficult one if you really do have a need to uh, go to town hall. Thank you, Councilor Nagel. Any other counselors? Councilor Minor. Just one quick follow-up as West Hartford, I believe, Weathersfield and a few of the other surrounding towns have switched over to individual town mandates in town. Has there been any consideration? Are we just gonna leave it as is in discretion of the, uh, the operators? As far as the pri private property businesses go, uh, yes. I don't believe that there's been any indication from the council that they want to follow that lead by closing or not closing, but requiring masks on in private businesses or private property. So at this point, uh, as the public safety director, I would continue doing exactly what we're doing, which is letting each private property owner determine whether masks should be worn or not. Okay, thank you. All right, any other council comment or question? All right, moving on to the next item is the 150th anniversary steering committee report. And I know Ms. Francolino is with us, welcome. Um, good evening. Um, my report this month regarding the activities at 150th committee will be brief. Presently, we are looking for volunteers to donate to our blood drive. Nancy Menke is doing a great job organizing this. It's scheduled from one to six on October 6th at our Savior's Lutheran Church. Um, remember, one pint can save three lives. Each donor um, will receive a piece of 150th memorabilia as a token of our thanks. You can register on the um, Red Cross website or there's a link posted on Facebook, which I will repost once again 
when I'm done here. Um, the only other thing is just a, a reminder that our um, 150th ball has been pushed forward to um, April 2nd in the hopes of avoiding um, COVID. Um, but before I leave you tonight, I think it's important to address the council remarks that were made during your August meeting. Unfortunately, I was on vacation. I could not be present to defend myself against some very personal and unwarranted attacks. The 150th committee met during the first week of August, at which time it was explained to those present that our treasurer had given birth to a baby five weeks prematurely. She was obviously preoccupied with matters far more pressing than her volunteer responsibilities to the 150th committee. I asked the two parties patience and understanding and assured them that their payments would be forthcoming. Neither of the two owed money that were owed money objected, so it could only be assumed that they were in agreement. The treasurer also reported a healthy balance had not changed over the prior month. Less than a week later, a member of the council took it upon himself to call me on the carpet personally, going so far as to wonder aloud as to what happened to the money the council had given the 150th committee. This left me to wonder if he was insinuating that I had somehow lost the money or even used it to go on vacation. I am here to tell you that neither of these is true and that all funds are present and accounted for. Payments have been made to those in need and everything is up to date. I would also like to remind the council that the guidelines for the Newington boards, committees, commission and commissions specifically states that members shall refrain from verbal attacks upon the character of other members of boards, committees, commission staff or the public. While I'm unsure if these guidelines hold true for the town council, I can only assume that the council should be held to the same standard, if not higher. The comments made about me were unwarranted and personally insulting. They demonstrate a lack of kindness that does not encourage anyone to step forward and volunteer to serve our community. We are better than this. We are, we are all working to make Newington a better place to live. These comments fail to reflect this. In the future, if anyone has concerns about the working of the 150th committee, please call me or come to a meeting and offer your suggestions during public participation. We can and must do better. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Francolino. Any member of the council have any comments or questions? Councilor Nagel. Uh, yes, since it may appear that I'm the person that Ms. Francolino was speaking to, I in no way was uh, in whatever comments I made, made uh, insinuated or intended that it be something personal. I just received information from several people uh, over a period of time that they had not uh, not been reimbursed. And um, I was merely following through since they were frustrated with things not being reimbursed. Uh, to the credit of everyone, promptly after our meeting, the, uh, uh, the monies were given to the parties and the situation was resolved. Uh, again, I would remind you that the public meeting is not a place to settle a question like that. It's uncalled for and unprofessional and just demeans my character. Councilor Mankey? Do we have a date? Uh Eileen, for the April ball, or what, what What are we calling it, or whatever we're calling it, I guess? Um, April 2nd. April 2nd? Okay, yes. the 101st ball? Uh, well, really, if we, if we wanted to be technical, we could say our year went from July to July, or maybe oh, we could point, call it right. the 150th plus one. I don't know. Whatever we... <laughs> whatever we it darn thing. I hope we can have it. I hope this yeah, the, the Yeah, make it the COVID ball. There you go. No, we want to. Thank you. Thank, and thank you for your efforts. I, I know that we, we've, we've moved we've moved this uh, um, extravaganza um, <laughs> event a couple times now, and I've, I, every time we have a date, I go out and buy a new suit. So yeah, um, I just have to keep buying new suits and new ties and new shoes. There you go. Me too. <laughs> the bottom line is, Eileen, you're not giving up, and we appreciate that. <laughs> no, we're not. We're going to have this one way or another. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. All right, the next item this evening is the uh, discussion uh, for the adoption of the Permanent Municipal Building Commission creation. I'm just gonna rearrange my screen so I can see what's on it. All right. I, um, just to address um, this earlier this evening, for those of you that were not in attendance, the public hearing was held on this agenda item to hear from the public. Several members of the public have also sent in uh, emails that were, will be attached to the minutes of that public hearing um, or public record. Um, and all of the counselors were able to read those. Uh, the 
the requirement is that they're in by a certain time the day before so that the counselors do have the opportunity to read those and make sure that they have familiarized themselves with what the public wanted us to know so that um, just so the public knows that is the procedure. Um, I will say that many of the um, concerns that were voiced, most everybody um, seemed to, not everybody, but most everybody seemed to be in agreement that it is a good concept, but there were some things that maybe needed to be um, fine-tuned a bit in terms of the language. And I would tell you that um, I did meet with you know, my caucus last evening to discuss that. And we had several, we have several recommendations for language changes. Um, and, and I'm sure many of you at the table do. So um, I just want everybody to realize we are um, here to listen to the public and make changes as we see um, make sense based on what the public has brought forward to us and based on our knowledge of the current situation. So with that, I'll open it up. I think a lot of the public participation and uh, comments were very valid um, concerns that we will address. Um, I will open it up. Councilor Menke, I believe you had your hand up first. I believe Councilor Camillo was oh, first. Sorry. Was, You're right. I moved my window. Councilor Camillo's hand is up first. Go ahead, Councilor Camillo. I believe this is a great concept and uh, some of the wording, it does need to be changed. Um, the two appointees by both parties, they should definitely be professionals. It shouldn't just be an appointment. Um, and as far as Existing building committees like Anna Reynolds, that's gone to referendum. They have their money and we should not abolish, get rid of that. It should continue to move forward with the people that are on it. And for future projects, as long as the, um, they've gotten their money through referendum, just like Anna Reynolds, we, we can't touch them. It just Anna Reynolds needs to continue to move fast going forward and uh we've got a great building committee there so um the library we heard from diane and we heard from leanne um maybe they should have a couple votes that's that's all i've got to say right now but yeah we've got to fine-tune some of this and and change the wording so thank you thank you Councilor Mankey? Yeah, as you, as you said before, our, our caucus has some su suggestions. So um, I, I sent them over to James just to actually just a little while ago, a little late typing them up. So it, um, James, do you have them on the, can you put them on the screen? So we just can go through these if, if you don't mind, if you'll allow me to go through them. Uh, we would add, um, this number eight here, you see that any pro prior project which has already been approved at a referendum will remain in effect for the duration of the project and will not be subject to this ordinance. So it, it, as, as Council, Council Camilla said, um, Anna Reynolds would stay where it was. I, I don't know anybody had any intention of, of getting rid of Anna Reynolds. I, I don't know where that came from. Um, once a referendum is passed, the, the people have spoken and, and, and it moves on. Um, I think all through in this process and this, this process of this committee has taken a couple of months to work out. I think that was the understanding all the way through the process that Anna Reynolds would continue. Um, but anyway, we're putting it here. It, it, we're making this addition to the, uh, to the ordinance. These are just proposed for the council. These are just proposed, correct. These are our proposals of, 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 of the ordinance. Do you want to discuss them one at a time? Because I think you had a few more. I think, right? We, I do have. We do have others. We can discuss them at one at a time. I, 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 whatever is easy for you folks, I, I, I guess. Why don't you go through them? Okay. Okay. If you don't mind, I, I can. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. And you can see in this section and on composition, we've really just added the fact that um, whoever makes the appointments, be the, be the town manager or the, the, the two political parties, they would have to go through the town council to be approved. Um, just like anybody on the building committee now would have to go through a town council to be approved. Um, the political parties appoint the, the representatives now, uh, but they still go through the, through the, through the council and we would, we would have that process continue. Yeah, I think, I think unfortunately, you know, we draft language and then um, 
the intent is known in our heads, <laughs> but sometimes it's not as clear in the language as we wish it were. So this just cleans it up. I, I, I appreciate that this was brought forward. And we, we also, we also do, we added, um, it's not highlighted here, but we also added um, or building trades. So anybody involved in, in building would be included. Um, I think that the language is architecture, landscape architecture or building construction. Um, so anybody involved in building trades would, would be, uh, would also be um, included. Um, so if you had a, you know, technically, I guess, an electrician or a plumber or a, a steel worker, uh, they'd be involved in building trades and they would certainly be an asset to the committee. Um, so we would just, we just broaden that, that's that scope. Uh, and then on the, we also would ask that um, on, the, on line two, it's also subject to the approval of the town committee, uh, we, uh, town council, I'm sorry. Just we want to make that we want to make that clear. Um, we're also asking that those people submit, uh, and again, it's not highlighted, and I apologize for that, but that those people who are appointed by the party would also have similar skills, uh, is, have similar qualifications as as above. Um, so, just because uh, the Republican or Democratic chairman presents somebody, they we would we would hope that they would present someone who had those same skills. Um, same building skills uh, and not just, you know, someone who didn't have those skills. I think it's important to get people on a committee uh, that, that have, have some, some background. Uh, I, number two, can, yeah, if I, I could just interject really quickly, the preferably piece was um, just that, as all of you know, it can be very difficult to get volunteers uh, for some of these committees and commissions. So while we want those appointees from the political parties to have, um, you know, some background, uh, reference uh, related to the fields, um, the trades. Uh, if for some reason you couldn't, you could still have the, a working committee um, with a, a representative brought forward as approved by the council. So it would be up to the council to kind of decide if that made sense or not, but um, to make sure that the committee could move forward with representation at all times. Right. right. Okay, sorry. Go ahead, Mr. Uh, Councilor Mankey, I apologize. Uh, then we uh, added, okay. added Number five here, um, and this is what was brought to our attention that as the, the library, the trustees own the building and the property, uh, we would we would we would add this 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 five where they would um, the Lucy Robbins Wells Library and surrounding property under the ownership and control of the board of trustees shall have have appointed for any project affecting the library grounds or structure one voting member appointed to the commission subject to the approval of the town council. Again, it's always subject to the approval of the town council, but it's they, they would get one vote. And this would only pertain, it's possible this, this commission could have be working on one or two projects at the same time. And this voting uh, would only be for when they're talking about their project, obviously. Uh, if it's a firehouse and a library, it would just be for the fire, for the library. Um, under A, ex officio membership, we took out the line we can see in red. Um, on number four, and then we just added number five, the requesting department slash organization shall have the ability to recommend an advisory ex officio non-voting member who will, uh, who with the approval of the town council will serve until the completion of the project. Appointment of an ex officio department member would be specifically for department projects only. So again, the ex officio would only, only serve for that project, not, they wouldn't have a, they wouldn't, and why would they stay for the rest of the meeting if it's not about their pro their their project? I would guess, but it would be only for their project. Can you go ahead, James. Go ahead, James. And then at number uh, J, instead of we see what town manager should be, the commission shall be authorized to approve change orders. Um, not, not necessarily the town manager. So once the commission's established, they would, as in the building commission for the for the uh, the town hall, they would they approve their own change orders and and they they took care of those. Um, if it's any you know any additional cost, then it has to come back to the town manager and the council anyway. And I think there's two more. I believe there are. And we just changed this clerk of the works to owner representative slash consultant. Um, in both these places. Um, I, again, I, I, I'm not familiar with the terms, but I own a representative. I've heard uh, uh, both, both Councillor Camello and Councillor Minor talk about 
owner representatives long enough to, that I kind of get the hang of that now. And I think that we just changed that wording to make it more, uh, more updated. And I believe that's all the changes we proposed, I believe. Oh, yeah, just, just again, in, on item M here, we change it from clerk of the works to owner's representative or consultant. All right, so I'll open it up for discussion. Councilor Annis. Thank you. A um, couple of things. Um, I would respectfully ask that we not vote on this this evening until um, we have had a chance to discuss this amongst ourselves. Um, it would have been nice if this was shared prior to the meeting. I understand there was a time constraint, um, but I'm respectfully requesting this be put off. Um, I do have a couple of comments um, going back and I can't scroll back. So James, can you go to the first one about uh, two about the appointment, the makeup of the committee? Um, Jesus. Okay, um, I do have a concern about the number of members on the committee. I would like to see that change or we'd like to see that change to five, um, maybe five who are qualified and two appointed by the majority parties. I don't know, something up for discussion. Uh, my other concern is when you're saying landscape architect, building structure, building trades, you might have somebody who is extremely uh, confident in reviewing contracts and, re and uh, and that type of thing, that could also be a classification of someone to be appointed or someone who has full knowledge as a, as a school building committee who has been in that building for many, 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 many years, that might be a perfect um, fit for that project. So when you took out, but shall not require additional qualifications, I, I don't fully understand why that was taken out when you said um, that that was necessarily not a requirement that they had to be one of those qualifications, one of those fields. Um, my other thing is, I would like to see the language on two, um, not appointed by the town manager, but recommended by the town manager and appointed, not approved, but the town council appoints members to boards and commissions. They don't approve the members. So anytime where it says subject to the approval of the town council, it should be subject to the appointment of the town council. Yep, um, I would like to see that point. language yeah. as well. Um, and it's a recommendation. It's not an appointment by the town manager. Yeah, that was our intent. Thank you for correcting that syntax. Yeah. Um, you did cover a couple of things. I was going to request that there be some sort of caveat in there regarding the Anna Reynolds building committee, that that stays as it is. And um, language regarding Lucy Robbins Wells. And um, you did keep in the language where um, if it was for a firehouse that there'll be a members from the fire department that would be ex officio members to be able to put in um, their in information. So that's fine. I think that's all I have for right now. But like I said, I re you know, respectfully request this be tabled into the next meeting to vote until we all have a chance to really read the whole thing in the entirety. It's kind of difficult to read it on the screen when James is moving it up and down. No, I agree with you, Carol, and, and I would recommend that we table this to the next meeting as well, just because it's a lot of language to digest. Um, <clears throat> Thank you. And, and hearing from Lucy Robbins, um, I think that uh, we had one of the language that we brought forward for Lucy Robbins did say one voting member. Um, so I, I would like to have an opportunity for one or more of us to reach out to them and talk with them a little more about their concerns, because I'm trying to understand their overarching concern about this. And I know it's a loss of control, so to speak, because they own the property, but the um, previous building committees, and there is one that's still there, even though it hasn't been meeting or it's kind of defunct at this point, but there is a building committee in place for Lucy Robbins, where um, I believe if I looked at it correctly today, um, that there are two voting members from the board on that committee. So that may be something we can talk with them about in terms of membership on, we had said one voting member, but if they are, you know, if two would be more amenable to them based on the previous structure, that might be something we could um, work on as well. So um, that would be something to look at in the next, um, over the next two weeks before our next meeting as well. Councillor Minor, you're next. Thank you. Uh, just wanted to add that I think in concept, we're, we're definitely heading in the right direction. I fully support a standing public building committee. The only addition I would add would be 
the opportunity to have uh, requesting programming departments, be it the fire department, the library, uh, you know, Parks and Rec, any of the requesting agencies to have a voting consideration at the table versus sitting ex officio. And if we could allow language in here to, you know, essentially state that, you know, the makeup would be a base makeup of, you know, X number of members, which is Councillor Ness alluded to, I would support a larger group. I think five is too narrow of a body to uh, effectively be able to work. And I think that as time goes on, you may have issues with getting a quorum with such a narrow group if people are unavailable. I know sitting on two building committees now that if we were a five member makeup, there would be several meetings we would not have been able to hold because we would not have had a uh, quorum to do so. Uh, as far as the question of Anna Reynolds, I think it's been clarified from the standpoint of the intent is it's a referendum pass project, but I would bring up the issues that we ran into with the town hall when we got to a point where the referendum amount could not be held, that it created a problem of, okay, now what? The council at that time considered to move forward and go over, which was done, but does that same statement hold true if you were to go ahead and say, we can't meet the budget requirements or we're going to choose to you know, go in a different direction in terms of, you know, build new versus renovate as, as, you know, renovate as new, those types of issues of exactly, if you're changing the scope of the project, then would you disband the project? And then the last of which being, and as the mayor just alluded to with Lucy Robbins, I sat on that committee initially back in, I think, 17, 16, 17, 18, that range of their renovation project building committee, which has basically sat idle for several years, what happens to that project? So as it is right now, it is a existing building project, as is the Mill Pond project. What happens to those projects? You know, we have the, uh, the wing expansion project still, I believe, is on the books. There's several other existing building committees that are open are those all disbanded and reformed under the new makeup or how do we proceed with those projects? So I think those are my comments right now and I'd be curious to what others thought about those. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Mankey? Yeah, just two things. One, uh, I would apologize to Councilor Annis that I didn't get these to her before. Uh, I, I intended to and I, it just slipped my mind that I didn't get to it. So I, I apologize for that. They were a last minute kind of, it took me longer to type them up than I anticipated. Um, also, as, as far as Anna Reynolds goes, I mean, the, the referendum passed for, for the 17.5, I believe, or 17, whatever, a million. That's the referendum. I think it, anything <laughs> happens after that is, is not really a purview of this, this ordinance. Um, it'd be up to the building committee to decide if they can, can meet that or not. And then we'd have to decide what to do with it at that point. Um, it, it's, it's clear from, from, I'm talking to my caucus, we want Anna Reynolds to move forward. Um, uh, there, there is no doubt it passed referendum and there is no doubt that, that it a, a needed project. I, I don't know what the, um, the confusion is there, but we're, we're ready to move forward with it. Um, and as far as the other changes, I think we can, you know, we can cer certainly look at these. These are, you know, we've been working on these for the last couple of weeks. Um, and and uh, I, I realize it's the first time we've got them all together in one, in one, in one, uh, one packet for you but we can certainly look at it, look at them. Okay, thank you. Councilor Camillo? Uh, what Commissioner Annis mentioned was uh, seven, five to seven, that works. And if we were, you know, have a minimum of five, fine, but you could have up to seven. The other thing is when you have the non officios and appointed with no skills as far as um, the profession is 
construction or, or any of that engineers, you have wants and needs. And that's why we don't want to have really political po appointees in there. We want the professionals in there. So we get the job done on what's needed, not what's wanted. And, and that's one of the reasons to have this committee too, is, is to keep the politics out of it. You're still going to be there no matter what you do, but it's a start and, it, and it's a way to, you know, we have to start looking at things. Um, you know, what killed, kills projects is, oh, we want this or we want that. And it's not needed. You know, we're not building Taj Mahals or anything like that. We're just building buildings for students, for town employees. And we may even have too many buildings at this point. So, and that's what the committee will, will help us do when they start looking at the Owens reports and, and going forward. Thanks. Thank you, Councilor Camillo. I apologize, guys, that I'm moving around a bit, but my back is really bothering me tonight. So if I stand and sit, I apologize. If I'm distracting, I will try not to. Um, let's see, town manager, Mr. Chapman. Yes, uh, I would like to make a clarification on something that's been said repeatedly concerning my uh, visitation to Anne Arundel School. Uh, I've been accused of never being there for the last 20 years. Uh, the records will clearly show that I was up there in March, I believe it was, when the report on the reef scope was leaking. I took a tour of the building with the principal. Uh, I came back to the council and reported what I found and recommended that if nothing gets done to Anna Reynolds, at least we need to put the roof on. Uh, and as far as being up there, when the governor went or came the other day, uh, for those of you that don't know, that was a uh, meeting that was scheduled on two different times. I was not available and I do not attend generally political type of, uh, events. So as town manager, that is not my role, but it certainly needs to be on the record that I did not not go to Anna Reynolds School for the last 20 years. I go all over this town, it is my job, and I don't like to be criticized by someone that doesn't know what they're talking about. Thank you. Councilor Mankey. I'm sorry. Yes, Councilor Mankey. Yeah, certainly I think we can look at the numbers in, uh, on this committee. I, I, I think the, the goal is to keep it a, a small committee and not you know, make it 20 members, but, but maybe five is too few, maybe seven's better, maybe it's gotta be an odd number, obviously. Um, I would think though, whatever the number be, I, I would think that we would, we would still request that, that the members that serve on the committee have some, some knowledge of, of how to build buildings or, or construct things. Um, ex officio members that come on from the, from the requesting department would have skills, other things. So if someone comes from human services, they would have skills on how human services works and what what their requirements for that, to, and they could bring that those those um, those insights to the committee because I think ultimately the goal is to to whatever project we're taking undertaking is to is to serve the town of Newington, um, but also serve the requesting agencies. So I think it's important that we remember that you know we don't just build things or or or, or take on projects in a vacuum. It's, it's for some for, for some reason, and those reasons. Um, would be whoever the requesting agency is, whatever they, they made the request at, what, what, what the need is. So we certainly can look at the number. I think that's a, you know, that's a possibility and we can, we can tweak that. Just a quick comment on the number two and, and my hesitation with increasing it. Um, and I'm not opposed to it. It's an open discussion, but right now on the table was five. I heard comments recommending seven. My only concern is I'm looking at current committees that we have in place where um, professional or specific credentials are required. So like our standing insurance committee um, and the employee benefits one, it's very difficult to find people with the credentials required to fill those committees and get a quorum. And so I'm a little concerned, the higher the number, the harder it will be to fill those positions. It's um, about so that's my concern just to share out and when we talk about the quorum, you're talking about a committee of five, you need a quorum of three members that come consistently to have meetings and, and conduct business versus a, a committee of seven, you would need a quorum of at least four, I believe, or, or five. 
um, in order to conduct business. So that would be my concern with increasing the number. Um, so I'm just throwing that out there. Uh, let's see who's next. Deputy Mayor Bedrako. Um, yeah, I just want to address a few of the, uh, or some of the comments that were made um, by the public. Um, first, well, I think it's, it's, this is not a novel or certainly a duplicitous um, idea to get a power grab. Um, if you do a quick search of the internet, um, there are many towns in Connecticut, um, too many to list actually in Massachusetts who have used this um, concept specifically for the same reasons we're doing it. Um, because design and construction projects have become increasingly complex, particularly at the municipal level. And the ability to, as projects come along, to staff and restaff, um, you know, commit um, committees and commissions, and to have a level of expertise is just very, very difficult in a town that relies on volunteers. So by having this, this core group of five to seven, whatever it's going to be, um, with knowledge of the build, not only is the knowledge of the building um, trade um, or um, industry important, but um, there's there's going to be a level of institutional memory so that each time a building um, committee or a, a new building or project is approved, you know, come, first of all, the, the uh, requesting um, organization, the sponsoring organization does their homework and research, research, realize that they want something, they bring it to the town council, which reviews and whatever, the town council has the authority to say, okay, let's move forward and um, get a, um, give it to this, this building committee. Um, at that point, the way it is now, um, there's an additional three to four months from the time the town council approves, you know, forming a building committee, because then you've got to go and get members. Then you've got to go and have organizing uh, meetings. Then you've got to bring, you know, new members up to speed on, you know, what the, what the concept of the building commission is, you know, how, you know, some of the, the terminology, whatever, it's just a, a long learning curve. So to have this core group, which will have institutional memory, I think is just really really key and, and, and important. And the ex officio members, um, actually, I think you're, well, I mean, I know this commission hasn't been formed yet, but you're kind of insulting members of the commission because I would hope that, I mean, most committees I've been on, ex officio members have a voice. They're there to give advice, to give guidance. They're an important resource. So it's not like they're just sitting there twiddling their thumbs. They're there for a reason and they're used as an important resource. So it's not that an ex officio member has no voice or no input. Um, and these meetings, this is a town um, commission. Their meetings are gonna be open to the public. There's gonna be public participation, whatever. So nothing is being lost. The only thing that's being gained is, is um, like I said, that, that core um, institutional memory and then one of the key things to, to me is that, um, to me, this does take more of the politics out of it because you're not, it's not gonna be, well, the majority party is gonna have three members and the minority is gonna have two or whatever. Each party is gonna have one member, you know, based on, on the political scheme, but the rest of it is gonna be based on expertise um, and approved through the town council. And this committee, by working on multiple projects or whatever, I would assume that they were gonna to have to be pretty well versed in the Owens report, pretty well versed on the town budget, what our resources are. They will be working with, with, with you know, what resources we have available through grants or whatever. So they are gonna have an overall view of everything that's needed to be worked on um, in the town and not subject to the individual, you know, um, uh, vocal and forceful, you know, different departments advocating for their own particular little need, regardless of what the other needs in town are. So this committee is going to have an overarching view of everything the town needs, plus be working on the, on the particular project. So as, as it is, so they're going to have the specific um, knowledge and skill for that specific um, building project, but they're also going to be taking it into context with the overall resource needs and needs of the town. So basically that's what I think. Thank you. Councilor Minor. 
Thank you. Just a couple of things that I wanted to clarify. James, if you could just scroll to the term for me, the terms. It's the downside of trying to do this without being able to look straight at it. The only concern I've got on the term length is, as Mr. Harpy alluded to when he had his uh, testimony in the public hearing, the town hall renovation project essentially started in 2016 and is just about wrapping up now. So you can essentially say five years. So as this is proposed, my concern is shifting off of an existing body and changing it up with membership, you know, midstream because things obviously change over a five year period. And that is my only concern on the length of maybe not extending, you know, having the makeup the same in terms of time frames, but extending the terms of each to be able to, to wrap up the work on one project before they advance off to another one. And the other thing being, I've got a question and I don't know if James can answer it, Keith, whoever, at what point does this body take over? Because there seems to be a discrepancy from what I've heard to what I've seen, at what point does this committee take over, you know, essentially project work? Uh, yeah, um, <clears throat> I don't know, Keith, if you want to address that or not, but it the, at the beginning, I'm trying to scroll through myself, I have it in here. Okay, so um, it's- I believe yeah, it was that once the council reviewed the project and deemed that it was appropriate to put forward, that it would be put by the council forward. Okay. That's correct. Yeah, so just trying to get a clarification on the major maintenance component. I mean, $25,000 in seven years is not anything that our facilities director can't handle. So I'm just trying to get a clarification to, you know, at what point are we expecting this body to take over for the, you know, facilities director and town staff is, I guess, what I'm getting at on that one. What's the proposal? Let me just say that, in my opinion, if if the maintenance it's got to be done, um, and it's not requiring a requesting agency to request it, then it would stay within the administration to handle. If if a requesting agency wants to go with a project of significance, uh, probably bonding is going to be required. Then that is certainly would be part of the committee. But the day to day or month to month maintenance. And, uh, and, uh, and improvements will uh, should be handled internally by the administration. Uh, and if the administration feels that there's a need uh, for extra advice and help, then certainly the administration will request that the committee be activated for whatever project they're looking at. Okay, so can we just, to clean this document up, can we establish either a floor or a baseline or a description or something to at least it quantifies what the intent is? Yes, that's for sure. Yes. Okay. Now is how we handle the board of education in terms of their requests. Are we still going to be going through as their PCIP or how, how are we proposing to handle those? Well, they, they, they've just hired their own facilities manager now. So there'll be, I believe operating just like we will on the general government side. However, if the Board of Education uh, seeks to uh, have a major project undertaken and it's gonna require significant money and bonding and so forth, then that would be referred over to the town council for consideration. And that's when the committee uh, will get involved and activated. But uh, short of that, it would uh, most most of the daily and weekly and monthly type operations would be handled by their facilities manager, probably working in conjunction with our facilities manager on certain aspects. Okay, I, I think just one that leaps out the mind on me is the uh, all the academy work that was done, you know, five or six years ago. I think it was essentially maybe a two million dollar project. I just wanted to see if we were going to handle it the same way that they would make a request. To the council or would they make it to the administration and you know how would we just filter that through i guess is what i'm getting at yeah and, and again chris i think that the fact that we have two brand new facilities managers on board now uh they may have a different perspective and i've i've uh, asked both of them to 
work together uh, going forward. So uh, I think that we're going to look to them to, uh, we'll say, come to the upper administration when they feel that it's uh, beyond their abilities and uh, and uh, you know the committee would be requested to uh, get involved. Okay, so we could just pretty much leave it that if they were requesting bonding or you know at least establish a level that they would expect it to follow this pathway for a project, I think would just make sense to clean it up and explain it. Okay. Thank you. Just to tag on to what Chris was saying, it would certainly uh, behoove us, and I'm sure, I, you know, I don't, I'm trying to see in there if I'm scanning it right now, but language that would indicate that any um, monetary values or any procedures here would be bound by the town charter as well. So we have to make sure, and I see it, you know, the town charter sections are um, noted throughout this, but to maybe perhaps put in a general caveat term that would say any um, existing and future charter so that if, Charter language changed or uh, referendum costs changed. You know, right now the, the limit is 975. If that were to change in the future, that we wouldn't have to redo this as well. It would just be in line with the charter. So some sort of language that would indicate that as well. Councillor Annis, you're next. I couldn't unmute. Uh, just a couple of things regarding um, the number of voting members, and you're saying it's difficult to get people that are in specific employment. The yep. standing insurance and the environmental quality are really pigeonholed of what you have to um, be, like an underwriter and, and that type of thing. Um, I think with having the, the building trades and, and this type of building experience, we're going to have a broader pool um, to pick to get volunteers from. So I don't think trying to get five members would be that difficult um, when you're when you're talking about this this commission. Um, the other thing is under composition number four, I think the language needs to be changed. No members appointed by the council shall serve on any elected or appointed boards or commissions. You're right. And, you're right. Okay, so I think that needs to get um, get changed. And then regarding the terms that Chris talked about, I think we should look at how TPZ originally started. They have four-year terms and I know they're staggered. Um, and I know when you start out with something like certain numbers serve for a certain number of years and certain numbers serve, members serve the full year and then it starts um, rotating every three years. So maybe we wanna look at four-year terms and do you know four, three serving two, four serving three, and then it would start um, uh, culminating every three years. Um, that could be something to look at because I am too concerned reading this again. When you put somebody on for one year, you know, what happens if somebody on the council doesn't like, you know, get, you, they need a little bit more than one year to get their feet wet and to see what's doing. So um, maybe a discussion can be brought up regarding that. Okay. Councilor Camillo. How does everybody feel about tabling this now? I make a motion to table. I I concur with that. All right, we have a motion to table on on the table. Um, <laughs> I see two hands up. Is there a second? Councilor Annis, was that a second? Yes, it is. All right, so discussion on the motion on the table, which is two table. There are two hands up, Councilor Menke. Yeah, I, I would agree. We can table it, make make the changes, get the, get a clean document and, and go from there. Thank you, Councilor Minor. Yeah, thank you. I would concur also. Uh, the only thing I would ask is, does it make sense to possibly do a work session on this with it being as important as it is to just try to clean this up and finalize it before it comes back out to complete. Work sessions. Can't do work sessions. Yeah, work sessions are a regular meeting or a special meeting really, because there's no such thing as a work session anymore. Um, everything has, is by FOI rules would have to be posted and run as a, as a meeting. So if we wanted to do an extra meeting, it would be a special meeting for us to do. 
necessarily know that that would be the, the way to handle Okay, so I guess we just work up what we can work up at this point and come back and see where we go from there. That's yeah, I think we'll be okay. My suggestion would be that um, we have James, if possible, uh, compile what we've discussed tonight in the working document, which it looks like he's been kind of updating things as he goes. Um, disseminate that, that to, um, to all of us for our review. And then if the majority and minority leader could meet with their caucuses and come up with any changes and that kind of thing and discuss amongst themselves so that we can finalize a document to bring forward to the next council meeting. We Does can do that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I Thank agree. You. Councilor Nagel. I just wanted to uh, concur that I do think since this is getting more and more complicated uh, that indeed to make a decision tonight in terms of what to include, what not to include and adjust uh, seems to be hasty. And there seems to be a little clearing up of, a, of opinion that needs to be done by all parties before this goes forward. So I would agree to table it tonight. Thank you. Councilor Minor. Yeah, just one more quick clarification so we don't have to do this later on. Two questions was one, uh, is there anything by state statute with a educational grant project that requires voting representation by the Board of Ed. If we could just verify that, yes or no, that being one, because I just would hate to jeopardize any grant if we weren't able to. And then the second being, if we could just come up with a firm floor amount, base amount that this uh, committee would take over would be my only other comment. Thank you. Uh, James. Usual when I get to raise a hand, huh? <laughs> um, if you'll notice on the screen, there is a section under powers and duties, specifically 10-291. That statutory provision requires that the town for any school project create a public building committee, but does not require specific voting requirements. It's all based upon your, your current ordinances in the town itself. If you choose as a council to add them in with a voting membership, that's your choice. Okay. Okay. Thank you for clarifying that. That one, that is one that I did review because I knew that would would come up eventually. Can we call the vote? Yes. Um, it sounds like everybody's on the same page, so we'll do a general vote. If there's any dissension, we'll do a roll call. So, all Before in favor, you, say aye. Oh, Before sorry. Aye. I just want to confirm that all of the councilors are in agreement with the strikeouts that are in red currently. And the current language that's there, I'll put that out as the draft document for you guys to review and change, or do you want to leave everything in as shown right now? I would ask that you leave everything that's shown and maybe leave the additional, right. do a different color, do green okay. or something, of discussions of tonight. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Yes, absolutely. Okay, perfect. Thank you. All right, sorry. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, the item has been tabled to our next meeting. Thank you guys. That was a very um, worthwhile discussion. I appreciate all the dialogue. All right, next item this evening is the adoption of the Land Acquisition Fund Amendment. Uh, for those of you that were not on the earlier meeting in the public, we had a public hearing earlier to discuss this uh, change um, in ordinance. And essentially the change in language <clears throat> is simply to add that there would be no less than $10,000 appropriated by the town each year through the budget cycle, um, through a budget appropriation. In the past, um, the language was, we felt a little vague and we are looking to make sure that this account continues to grow. So that should uh, land opportunities become available, we would be in a better position to move on those when they become available. Uh, so I will, let's see. I need someone to go ahead and read the motion in for me. Deputy Mayor Bedrico, please. Um, yes, resolve that the Newington Town Council hereby approves the amendment to the Newington Code of Ordinance, Chapter 48, Funds, Article 5, Land Acquisition Fund, Section 48-21. A copy of said ordinance is attached to this resolution. Second. Thank you. Seconded by Councilor Camillo. And any further discussion on this item? I will just comment that we, during the public hearing, we did have one member of the public um, say she was in favor of this and pleased to see us moving this forward to clear up this language. It's been a 
ongoing kind of question mark each budget uh, that we go through. So, all right. All right, I don't see any discussion. So all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously, thank you. Okay, next item is discussion of the panhandling ordinance language. Um, and we do have attorney Ancona on with us this evening to help us through this discussion if we need him. Let me just scroll down and make sure he's still there. I saw him earlier, yep. All right, and so we had um, continued this discussion from July 13th and July 27th regular meetings. Um, we were supplied with ordinance examples from nine towns. And we are here tonight to discuss further where we want to go with this. So I will open it up to the counselors. Councilor Camillo. I really think we should leave this alone. There's enough laws if they're enforced, trespassing, uh, causing a nuisance, breach of peace, uh, endangerment. Those are the laws that are there. We don't need to have a special ordinance for that. All somebody has to do is make a phone call and the police would arrive and handle it. Finding the people, they don't have the money to pay for it. Just just leave it be. We really shouldn't be getting involved in this. I know nobody likes pulling up to a stoplight and someone's staring at you with a sign, hungry, homeless, please help me. But it does, those people do need help somehow. And I think we're just going to make it worse. If they're causing a problem, you call the police. That's all. Thank you, Councilor Camillo. Other council comment? Councilor Donahue. Yeah, I, I, I agree with uh, Mike. Uh, just, you know, it, it, it's like, you know, adding, adding, a, adding an ordinance, just add an ordinance or, or something that just, it seems, you know, maybe a catch-all, but I, I think we have enough laws in place to, you know, make this obsolete, and we have the help available if they need it or if they want it. Okay, thank you. Councillor Minor. Yes, thank you. Yeah, I think the issue here is if we do have the existing laws in place, they're clearly not being enforced. There has been periods in time in town that the police department granted, they may have been in a better staffing position at the time that were more aggressive with these type of instances. And you do hear on a regular basis of them having to deal with this on private property. You know, my concern is we're not just pushing them off private property at the landlord's request onto public property where they're creating you know, a hazard to traffic that's there but also being you know, at risk themselves. And when you start stepping out in traffic across multiple lanes to go try to collect from somebody, you're, you're creating a public hazard as well as to yourself. So my concern is just by saying, oh, we have the existing uh, laws in place, I would ask what do we have that currently covers panhandling on an ordinance level or what has the police department utilized in the past when it was enforced? And I'm not sure if attorney Ancona is aware if there is specific ordinance in place or if they're just using existing statute, but you know, I, I feel to just not touch it is just doing a disservice. So I'd be curious to what attorney Ancona has to say. Thank you. Thank you. Attorney Ancona, do you wanna to respond to that? Yeah, I'm, I'm not, in, can you hear me, Mayor? Yes. Yeah, I'm um, sorry, I'm having a little bit of trouble. Two judges said they couldn't hear me today, but um, I'm not sure what uh, Councilor Minor is actually asking. I don't know of any uh, issues where the police have been involved with panhandling. Uh, I did look at all the ordinances that James sent over from various towns, and it's pretty much one basic ordinance that somebody must have drafted at some point and, and most of these other towns that have them uh, just adopted. Vernon and East Hartford are different. Um, again, I, I think we're running afoul of the First Amendment. I feel like Bill Murray and Groundhog Day. I don't know how many times I can tell you guys this. Uh, this is not a good thing to do. I, re I did a nationwide search on lawsuits regarding panhandling 
and I could find not one instance where a municipality was successful in the lawsuit, not one. Uh, again, like uh, Councillor Camillo and Councillor Donahue said, these issues are already governed. They're already uh, covered under various criminal statutes. And why, why look to create a problem when everything is basically covered right now? I mean, unless I'm missing something, yeah. maybe you guys, somebody there can tell me why we keep addressing this. Okay. Uh, next hand up is Councilor Camillo. Or wait, hold on, Councilor Camillo, would you yield the floor? I think Councilor Minor put his hand up and it may, Councilor Minor, do you have a related response? Yeah, I would just like to reply uh, to Attorney Acona. I think the issue is that there has been periods of time in town that we have enforced this. So of what, or were they using any ordinance that we have in place or there is no ordinance that covers this and they were just using existing statute regarding a creating a public nuisance or you know trespassing on a right of way, whatever the case may be. Was that how it was being handled previously or were they handling it differently? Because it has been enforced in the past. My I don't know, Attorney Ancona, I know you said you weren't privy to that, but I, my recollection when we had counsel, um, I'm sorry, Chief Clark here in the past when we discussed this um, the last time around, I don't know how long ago that was, but he had mentioned, Chris, that um, they do use the existing laws, that there are laws that govern it. So if it's, you know, um, public property, if they're a safety hazard or risk, if they are causing a distraction like to a driver, um, anything that would hit under a, a, an existing law that they would be able to intervene if it's a private property and the owner calls then they would be able to to do it that way so the chief had indicated that there were ways for them to address it um, in the different situations but as far as i know he had not indicated there was any ordinance and i think attorney and kono would you concur that there's no existing ordinance to address that yeah that's correct and i i just if you could give me an example counselor minor I, i'd like to address it i I don't know of any examples other than what Chief Clark was talking about. I would certainly encourage you to look at the email that James sent um, some time ago. He included a, a pretty good article. It's very short regarding Glastonbury and what their chief was talking about, Marshall Porter. And, um, and it sounds like he has a very good grasp of the First Amendment and why adopting these panhandling ordinances are just not a good idea. Uh, you've got, a cycle that's going to be created where you've got the arrest, you've got the release, you've got a, a fine that they can't pay, and then they're back on the street doing it again. We can't even handle dirt bikes, and you're going to try to tackle panhandling? I, I, I don't know. So then the easiest statement I think we can make as a body is that if the residents or visitors in town have instances where they observe it or they feel uncomfortable, to contact and document the police, let them do it that way. Am, am I understanding that the way you're recommending? Sure, but I don't know about being uncomfortable calling 911 because you're uncomfortable. But yes, in essence, yes. Okay, yep. but the, the issue comes into play and I've seen it repeatedly play out multiple times of people sitting on the center island of the turnpike where they step out into traffic to collect whatever they are from vehicles in front where they're stopping vehicles from behind and creating an unha you know, unsafe environment of trying to go around, I think is the easiest part. Right. And that, that would, would be, be a call to the police. That would be a safety risk. And, and that's, okay. Uh, that's my, I mean, my thought is if, and you actually, Chris, you made a very valid point when this was brought up a few meetings ago that if it's posted on the turnpike, that there's no pedestrian traffic allowed and they're on there as pedestrians, they're walking on the turnpike, they're standing there, then that would be an enforceable um, offense that you could call the police for, certainly. I, I was actually, um, I hadn't thought of that when you brought it up. I, I was impressed by that comment. Yeah, but back to Tony Ancona's point. Okay, we're going to cite them. We're going to issue them a citation for trespassing with no pedestrian traffic. And we're back to doing the same thing. Part of the component when we were talking about this initially, and I can't remember one of the other councils brought it up, which I thought was a great idea, is if they are making contact with these individuals, because it's generally the same ones, is to get them 
in th- at least in touch or point them in a direction of the possibility of getting them help if they do indeed need help. And I think that is something that should be addressed at the same time versus more of an enforcement of we're going to give you a ticket. And I, I don't think that's the intent. It's just what we're trying to do is discourage them to go elsewhere. And without having it in place, I think we're allowing it to occur and just to turn our head to a blind eye on it and say, it's, we just, we can't do anything about it. That's my concern. But you can't do anything about it. That's the reality. That we can't do anything about it? Is that what you just said? That's correct. That you cannot. So if they're trespassing on the turnpike, then they should be issued a a citation for statute violation, correct? I, I suppose you could call the police and get somebody to arrest them for standing at the exit ramp. I, 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 I just wonder if, if, if that's the society that we have evolved to or devolved to, I just, I am beside myself that we consider, repeatedly consider violating the first amendment to the constitution. I, I am beside myself. Um, maybe I just take this too personally, I don't know, but the constitution is the paramount document in this country and we seem to have forgotten it just because we want to make things better. Uh, Chris, uh, Councilor Minor, I understand your, your frustration. I do, I get it. But I don't think this is the avenue. If we want to send out social services, human services, go to talk to them. Hey, how are you? Are you okay? Beautiful, that's great. I just can't imagine citing somebody with a sign that says hungry, need food, I, I just can't see it. And, and then arresting them, you're going to have to arrest them at some point if they don't comply. What happens then? Get food. <laughs> yeah. I know in the past when the chief was on, he did indicate they're not looking to go out and arrest people for these violations unless it crosses the line where they have to. So they have in the past gone out to make contact with folks that are panhandling to see if there's anything they need, if there's any way that the town can help. They have put people in touch with human services or offered that. Um, so that is our first line of defense always. And according to the chief, when he was here, that is pretty much what he had said to us. And if I'm wrong, counselors, you can correct me, but that's my recollection of the discussion. So I do think that in these instances where they're breaking a law, so to speak, they could be arrested. I don't think that's our philosophy as a town or the chief's philosophy, um, but an ordinance wouldn't necessarily do anything differently either or, or allow a solution, I don't think. And I agree, Your Honor. And, and my concern is that we're ultimately be opening ourselves up to First Amendment lawsuits. And why do that? Why pass an ordinance basically just to make yourselves feel good? And I'm not saying that disrespectfully. I'm, I'm being genuine here. Don't do something that really has no positive benefit. As redundant as that sounds. All right, we have a few hands up. So, Councilor Camillo? I started making a list, and one of them was, yes, let's have human services go out. But what Chris was saying, multiple lanes, well, those are state roads, and that's for the state police to handle. And and most of our main intersections are state property. Um, And the policies over the years have caused this. Maybe... Chris should call our state legislators and say, hey, we need to do something about this like they're doing about stealing catalytic converters and and those things because they're not doing anything about that either. And they're trying to change the policies. They've already made policies. Um, And now with landlords being able to evict, I think you're going to see more people out there. But a lot of the people, I'm on New Britain Avenue, West Hartford, the Berlin Turnpike every day. And they're new faces every couple of days and somebody shows up and gives them something to drink, which is part of their group. This is not just a single person. And, you know, I, I see encampments up on the mountain, on Cedar Mountain, in the woods, underneath the trees, along the train tracks, there's encampments now. Or I haven't seen any of those since I was a kid. And I think you're going to see more of that stuff. As long as you're not on Main Street or in the corner of Cedar and Main, sleeping in tents, um, and and that's coming. So, panhandling, I think we should leave it alone. 
And when you do see somebody, if they look like they need help, call and get them some help. And that's all. All right, Councillor Mankey. Yeah, it sounds to me like we, again, if this is a safety concern and someone's stepping out of the traffic, then that's a, a, a problem and, and the police should be called. Um, because it's, it's a chance, it's an accident, it's an accident waiting to happen. Um, it'd be nice if we could somehow get these people some help or, or get them some, like, like Councilor Anson, get us some food, <laughs> get them a, a hamburger or something. But um, it's going to happen. This is going to happen all over. It's going to happen over and over again. And I, I don't think we need an ordinance. We should maybe just need to look at enforcing or, or, or policing the people that the, the issues we have. To, I mean, standing in the corner, he may be hungry. He may need. He may be needing my dollar to to get by. But that's my choice. But if he's standing in front of my car asking for a dollar or washing my windows for a buck, then that's a police matter. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Ernest. Thank you. Um, I will tell you, and these people, you see the same people in other towns and they're constantly moving around. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, it's just not Newington residents. You, you see them. I've seen the same person on the Berlin Turnpike on the Celestine Highway in at um, been in, in Cedar. So they just move around and they're picked up, they're driven around. Um, I think the best, I don't know what the police hand to them. If the police, if the police sees, sees them, they should probably have some information that they could hand to the individual saying, you know, if you need food, if you need shelter, this is, this is where you need to go. And, and maybe we can help them that way. Um, I don't know, instead of verbally telling them, Let's have something in writing for the police. Not that they need anything more to, to get to hand out to people. But I mean, I, these people do need services and maybe they need help, maybe they don't. I don't know. And if, if it's a concern that the, the town is gonna be on the hook for lawsuits or whatever, you know, maybe there's another way that we can handle this if, by statute as um, everybody else is saying. Um, but. You know, I think we got to do whatever is right for the town and for the residents. My window's been knocked on and you just try to ignore them. That's all you can do. All right, thank you. Councilor Minor. I, I, what it comes down to is, is what do we do? I mean, we're, we're just at a point now that I'm not suggesting arrest. I'm not suggesting fines, but we need to do something or at least develop a formula that says this is our policy of the town of Newington that says if the police are to engage any of these individuals, that this is how they're going to contact them and this is the procedure they're going to use. I don't think anybody here is looking to challenge or discourage that, but in the same token, when you hear conversations that, you know, Councillor Camillo, Councillor Ness just identified of these same individuals being moved around from town to town, it sounds like it's an organized effort more so than somebody that's truly down on their luck. I think there's a distinction. But to just go ahead and say, well, just leave it alone. And well, if you say they step out into traffic, which they obviously do, if anybody's sitting in the center lane of the turnpike, whether you're going northbound or southbound, they're sitting on the center island and they're stepping out into sometimes two lanes of traffic. That is an accident waiting to happen. And it won't be by intention. It, it's just going to be an accident. And then I'm concerned, what culpability do we have to that? That we knew it was there and allowed it to occur and didn't do anything and just turned a blind eye. So again, I'm not looking to, to punish anybody, but I think to just not do anything and just leave it without having some type of policy or procedure in place, I think is just not, doesn't, doesn't do what we're supposed to be doing here. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Mankey. Um, might I suggest that uh, Mr. Chapman and, and Chief Clark get together and come up with maybe a plan or just to discuss this issue and see if there's some something they can put their heads together, maybe even with including someone from human services, um, to see if there's a, a way we can, we can uh, mitigate this matter. We can do that. Thank you, Councilor Nagel. Uh, I would agree that that's a good idea. I was going to state before uh, uh, Councilor Mankey just made his comment that um, it's intent of the person who is homeless 
as to why they are there and for what reasons. Some are for granted reasons uh, that are unfortunate. Um, they're destitute, they're whatever, they don't have, they really do need assistance, but there also are those who uh, wish to take money for some purpose. Uh, I, I know people who have offered, uh, hamburgers have offered uh, coupons like uh, at Halloween, you know, the coupons, go. They, did, they don't want them, they want the money. And it's hard for the police, let alone us, to, to figure out or to know that one size doesn't fit all, that indeed uh, what their purpose for being there is, and it complicates the whole matter. Um, it makes it even more difficult. And I know we all want to help in some way, but we also want to deter uh, those that are using it for whatever funds they may get for purposes that are not in the best interest, though they might not think so for themselves, um, let alone for the town to, uh, or, or drivers or whatever to, to be put in, in situations where accidents may occur, be it um, uh, stepping out into the, into the street uh, for whatever reason in a car coming by or being blocked by some uh, well-meaning person in a vehicle wishing to, to hand money out when indeed there were a pile of cars or a line of cars that are, that are backed up that wish to get through uh, the intersection uh, and are not aware of what's going on. It's just a, just a comment and I know it makes things even more frustrating, but something to, to consider too when, uh, when uh, Mr. Chapman and, and our chief of police uh, have a conversation as to what we can do or not. Thank you. All right, any other council comment or question on this? All right, then I think we're gonna move on. Thank you, everyone. The next item under new business is discussion of virtual meeting standards for boards, committees, and commissions booklet. Um, I brought this forward to the agenda setting crew um, as a concern and my rationale for bringing this idea forward was when we started doing virtual meetings, uh, you know, when we were just gonna shut down for two weeks, um, none of us could have imagined that after such a long period of time, we would still be virtual um, in so many ways. Um, so our town council rules of procedure do not address uh, virtual meeting standards. And I thought that that might be a worthwhile discussion to have. I had suggested a few ideas and James was kind enough to pull up some things uh, from his research, as well as the things that we had mentioned at Agenda for our consideration. Um, and the uh, rationale be behind these is that this is a regular public meeting. Every meeting that we have as a council, whether it be public hearing, special meeting, regular meeting, whatever type of meeting it is, it should be treated as what a regular in-person meeting would be to the best that we can. Um, and so that being said, um, and I used this example the other day, I think that cameras should be on and I would throw that out there as one of the suggestions that's on the form um, during a meeting so that the public can see who's present, who's part of the meeting. Um, it's easy to see if someone's there for a discussion or not. If your camera's off, no one knows if you've left the room um, during a discussion and when you come back to vote, whether you were part of the discussion or not because your camera wasn't on. And so that was my rationale for suggesting that. Um, when we are in person in a meeting, <laughs> You have to go to the bathroom, to the restroom. You have to get up in front of everybody and leave the room and everybody knows you left for that discussion item. Um, and that is just the way it is. And that's, um, you know, so I would rather see on camera that you have stepped away for a moment um, and we know whether you're there or not. So that was uh, my rationale for that one. Um, so you've all been provided with a list of suggestions. And so um, given that explanation, I'll open it up for discussion. Councilor Mankey. Council, you're muted. I had some great things to say there too. <laughs> uh, nobody thought we would be doing these Zoom meetings this long, and, and but I'm I'm afraid that Zoom meetings are probably a thing of the future. Um, even if when we get to get out the other side of this COVID, um, there will be times when um, one of us will be away, and we can still participate in the meeting through a Zoom meeting. And I think that's probably. Uh, you know the, the new technology so I, I think some of these require these are these are great i think certainly i, I don't nothing about this council but I, I if you're on a board or commission you should dress the part i think so even though if you're on the camera you should 
you know, not be sitting there in, in, in your swimming trunks and a, and a, and a tank top. Uh, you should be dressed as you, you were going to a regular meeting. I think that'd be, that would be uh, critical. And I think it's also important um, about executive sessions that when, wherever you're having the, your Zoom set up, it's a private location so that, so that what, what's discussed in the executive session, which is, is meant to be private and, 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 and super confidential, isn't overheard by other people in the family um, because that's, that, that violates the, you know, the ethics of, of being a town counselor. When you're executive session, it's, it's important that, that just those people that, that have, um, have, the, have the right or, or, or the responsibility to know that information, have that information. Um, so I think, I think we, should, we should look at some of these rules that would, wouldn't, it, it, it's not a, a, something that's gonna go away. I think we're gonna have Zoom meetings at one form or another for not, not in all Zoom, but there will be part, part of these Zoom meetings of people who are away from it and can't get to the meeting for whatever reason. Um, so we should have some rules that, that govern the council and, and also all the boards and commissions. Okay, thank you. Other council comment or question on these? Councilor Nagel? Uh, I think most of us uh, are, we are now more than we were several months ago, aware of how our, our being on the screen um, makes us more, uh, our appearance more to others and not knowing if indeed the, the picture is on the screen or not on the screen at any given time. So uh, uh, people need to be more aware of that kind of thing in the and what it presents in terms of the council and for all of us um, uh, personally and individually um, that we are at a business meeting uh, and makes it even more apparent than when we're alive uh, in a live appearance in a room uh, where people can't uh, be looking at each individual in an audience at a period of time. Um, so while I think a, a lot of the things that have been mentioned whatever seem to be common sense, uh, that they really should be documented in some way just to reassure of people that, hey, hey, look, this is happening. You are being seen. Uh, what you do makes a difference and, um, and uh, you should be knowledgeable of it. Um, I know it, sound, it sounds like rules for high schoolers or middle schoolers. Uh, I know that isn't the intent but uh, it is something so that we all are under the basic rules. And if someone needs to be reminded, maybe not an open meeting, but somehow that what they're putting forth may not be what they intend to or uh, what's being put forth uh, in their video uh, presentation on the screen, that it, 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 it represents something that reflects upon uh, the town and each of the other individuals on the council. Thanks. Thank you, Councilor Miner. Thank you. I think that uh, a lot of this is, is very relevant. What I would ask is moving forward when in-person meetings do resume, that is this going to become the new norm that you're able to participate via Zoom when we're outside of either executive orders or a pandemic or whatever the case may be. Uh, you know, it has occurred in the past if counselors were on vacation or what have you, and it was an important vote that they were able to call in, you know, are, is that any different from being able to call in than being able to participate in Zoom? Uh, and quite frankly, in my case, the vast majority of time that I don't go on video is either I'm in my house and digital and virtual backgrounds to me are very distracting, especially if the person moves around because you blur and it's just, it's not a natural appearance of allowing, you know, your background to be just what it is, which in my case is I don't necessarily need to be in my office or be in my vehicle or whatever the case may be just moving forward. How do we address those issues? You know, I think it's always been a general expectation, especially when we're sitting in the setting of a council that we meet in person and it's a much different discussion. It's a much different feeling to be able to sit across the table from one another. And I think the decorum is totally different when we're in person versus virtual. So, 
you know, my next question would be, where are we from going back in person now? I mean, we're a body of nine, 10 if you include staff, or excuse me, 11, 12, whatever the number may be, that that is how I have always envisioned being there because we are all there present in mind and body. And if we're virtual, it is allowing for, you know, phones or tablets or whatever, or just being just generally distracted with the environment where you're in, that I think that the quorum should be that we're held meetings in person. So I just wanted to get out, get that out there and see what anybody else's opinion was to it. Thank you. Thank you. I do think that moving forward, we have to consider Zoom or virtual platforms based on the executive order. James, do you want to comment on the current executive order that's requiring some of that? That is correct. So currently, as I indicated in the memo, the legislature is working on a report about the use of virtual software going forward. They expect to have the um, committee completed and a report to them by April of 2022. Now, the current public act that's in effect allows us three meeting types, in-person, hybrid, or full virtual. When we are in a hybrid state or in an in-person state and an individual does not want to attend our meetings directly, at that point, we have to make accommodations for them. So that can be an additional cost to the town that we have to bear as well as allowing for a location. Uh, and that can be difficult. If you're all in the same room, that's a different story. But if we're in that hybrid format, it's a very difficult process to manage, especially with the issues that we all are seeing now with chip shortages, computers, even with our current um, replacement program, we're still looking at a possibility of December before we even get close to new replacements in the town. So those are the things that we have to think about when we move either from uh, our full virtual state where we don't have any of those additional requirements. There's nobody who's in the building during those meetings other than myself, but that's me virtually as well. Uh, but when we start having five people virtually and four people in the room, and then we have an issue with technology and people get knocked off, then we have problems that we have to take care of ahead of time. And we have uh, interruptions to the meeting that have to take place under the statute. So that's one of the reasons that we haven't gone back into the, to the full in-person as well as the requirements by the town manager. We're in red, we're not meeting in person right now, and that's a directive to all of the committees, which is why we've taken the uh, liberty of starting to train those department heads and their staff to manage those meetings for us as well. It's been a very long 18 months. Um, but that, that I know that's a, the long answer to the short question, Chris, and I hope that makes a little bit more sense on it. No, it does. But my only you know, caveat to that would be is that if we physically are able to be in the building, i.e. in yellow, out of red, out of orange, in yellow, you're always going to have that person that does not physically want to be present for whatever their reason may be. You know, obviously, probably getting uh, the virus would be the, the first and foremost. But do you have to accommodate them if you are entirely in person? So if we were in yellow and we're able to meet in person, is there still a required accommodation by the existing orders? Not if all members are present in the room, because then that allows for the public attendance as well. So if you have one member who's virtual and eight members who aren't, we still have to make that accommodation for the public. When okay. We're hybrid, we don't have that requirement. Okay, so bringing it back pre-pandemic, if we were allowed to meet in person, if our equipment and technology of the room, which is that up to the point where we are ready for it? Or are we still waiting on parts or components? We are waiting on parts at this point. Our vendor subcontractors coming into full wiring, and then our main vendor will be coming in to do the full replacements after that's completed over the next two weeks. Okay, so in the event that we were able to meet in person and had a counselor unable to be there, if they were to participate via audio, would you still have the same requirements of being quote unquote hybrid? Yes. Okay. The, the, That's the all I act that went into effect as of July 1st 
uh, does indicate telephonic as well as video. Okay, thank you, James. You're thank welcome. you, Mayor. Thank you, Council Minor. Councilor Ennist. Thank you. So I'm going back pre-pandemic. If someone was sick, they didn't come to the meeting. If someone was on vacation, they didn't come to the meeting or they tried to plan their, their vacation around the meetings. The problem with the Zoom thing is now everybody is 24 seven, nobody's getting a break. And so when we go live, if you can't be there because you're sick or because you're on vacation, then you just don't attend the meeting. That's how it used to be for how many hundreds of years. Um, you know, so I, that's why when you guys talk about, well, one person is sick and they're not gonna come and they wanna go Zoom. You know what? They weren't there before, there's no need. Unless it's a major vote, they can call in like, you know, like it happened before. I just think that we're getting to a point now where I think people are just getting tired of doing the Zoom. They're not paying attention. Public isn't paying as much attention as when we were live. And I think we need to go back to normalcy into the way it used to be. This is just, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be very honest with everybody. I just can't do Zoom anymore. I do Zoom during the day. I'm on my computer all day. It's very difficult to do it at night. And I know a lot of public officials are feeling the same way. But I think the, the subject at hand, though, is while we have to do Zoom, do we want to have standards in place for the meeting? That's the agenda item. So it's not really when will we go back because we don't know that based on the numbers or based on what Central Connecticut Health District recommends. But we've been in this, mo I, I, I just felt like we didn't do this a long time ago because we thought it was going to be so temporary. It's not so temporary. The governor's order is saying we have to at least accommodate people if the need arises. Um, so do we as a council want to adopt some sort of virtual meeting requirements so that if in the effect, in the event that we are virtual, there would be rules or expectations that would be, that would mirror a public meeting in person is the, is kind of the question. Councilor Mankey. No, I agree. We should, we should, um, we should adopt some kind of rules and, and procedures or, or requirements if you, whatever. Um, because it, again, I, I think everybody hopes we go back to in person as soon as possible, but who knows where the next variant hits us and we, we're back in the same. So I think we should, we should adopt some of these rules or some, some format of these rules. Um, I don't know if we want to have, have a subset of people to look at the rules and, and see which ones we like and which ones we can change or adopt them in mass or, or what, but we should, we should look at some of these. Thank you. If there's no further discussion on this, what I would recommend is that everybody take a look at the document that was presented and just kind of uh, come forward at the next meeting when we bring this forward um, with suggestions. I see Councilor Camilla just put his hand up. Go ahead, Councilor Camilla. And even though we're talking about this with the council, you've got zoning, you've got other committees, uh, the town planner, I know she's part of a couple of groups where the town planners and a lot of towns don't want to stop doing Zoom. So you come up with where everybody has the same policy or whatever we're going to do with this. So. Yeah, the agenda item says that it was really meant to be virtual meeting centers for boards, committees, and commissions booklets. So it would govern... I think this is us leading by example, so to speak. So if we're saying that this needs to happen for us, then it should be across the board in our boards and commissions booklet as well for all committees and commissions. You know, I mean, I've been on meetings at work and I've been on public meetings where I've seen a lot in the background that probably shouldn't have been on a Zoom meeting. And I've also seen people um, dressed in bathrobes and, you know, right. tank top t-shirts that I mean, you would never ever in a million years walk into a public meeting at town hall in that attire. And that's where we're trying to set a standard for these meetings um, to make sure that they don't deteriorate just because we're by, by means of being virtual. And, and Chris, I mean, you're never on camera. So what's up with that? Are you okay? Counselor, Counselor Camilla, we, we really don't. <laughs> Just asking because we right never now. see him. Um, the next hand up is Councillor Minor. Uh, thank you for uh, my concern. I greatly appreciate it, Councillor Camillo. 
yeah, as I stated before, unfortunately, I would rather sit in a public building right now. I would rather sit in a council chamber by myself than have to be in view of the dog walking by behind me or a barking dog or television or radio or whatever distraction there may be. And I choose to be in as private an environment as possible so I can concentrate on the content of the meeting. With that said, I agree that we need to formulate some type of a policy moving forward with this. But I would also ask why at this point that the vast majority of our surrounding towns are meeting in person that we're not. I don't care if we have to keep passing the microphone back and forth between three tables if that's what we need to do. But you know, to say that we need to do this and you have to be on camera in your own house or in your own vehicle, wherever you may be, I think is, is an overstep. Maybe to speak when you speak that you put your camera on. I think I could agree with that, but I would hate to be a distraction to anybody else by having anything else in my personal life going on behind me. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Menke. We just follow your suggestion. Take a look at these and come back with our next to our next meeting, um, and we can sort of pick and choose which ones we think we should we should adopt. Keeping in mind we adopt them for keeping in mind we adopt them for the for all boards and commissions. So every board and commission would have would would follow the same on um, the same guidelines. Sounds good to me, James. So the recommendations that I have on the screen for you currently. Those are actually part of at least three other virtual meeting best practice guides that I pulled together. So I'll send those out as well. Uh, so everybody can look through them, get some ideas. Maybe there's something else that you wanna pull out of there. Um, and then we can pull that back together and discuss it at the next meeting. And we could possibly integrate those into the boards and commission booklet for a further adoption at a later meeting. Perfect, thank you. Councilor Minor. Yes, just one final comment. With the schools being currently open, is there anything prohibiting the building committee from meeting in person within a school building if they are open to the public? Because it's very difficult, especially now when we're getting into a point of reviewing schematic designs to try to look at it on a 19 inch monitor. It would be far better served from all the committee members to understand and be able to collaborate with each other to be able to have it on full screen like we have done in every other project that I've been involved in versus the way we're currently have to now. Chris, that's, I mean, one, it's very off topic from what's on the table right now. Um, but I, I would suggest that the chairman of that committee talk to the town manager and or superintendent to, to figure that out. Okay. Just okay. with a related topic, that was why I brought it up. Thank you. Thank you. James, you're next. Uh, relating to that topic, we'd have to ensure if that was to take place, that we have the ability to record that meeting or to transmit that meeting. We need to make sure that it's posted to our website within seven days. So you have to make sure there is some facility on site in order to handle that. That is one thing we would have to think about. Okay, thank you. Guys, trying to stay on topic here, we still have some agenda items to get through and it's getting late and we have an executive session as well. So as, as clearly, clearly as we can, let's stay on the virtual meeting standards or we're gonna move on. Councilor Camillo. Real quick, James, can we get a packet for that? Would that answer Chris's question? Just like we do for our meeting now. There's no reason we couldn't create a packet for that. As long as the um, consultants are able to send us over the files, we can create those. We do them for TPZ, so it shouldn't thank, be. A thank you. All right, folks, so review the standards that were set up, uh, set in front of us, as well as what James sends out. We'll come back and have a further discussion on this item. Next item this evening is resignations and appointments. We have one resignation for Economic Development Commission, Jay Slater. Councilor Mankey. I believe that's mine. Yes. Re resolved, the Newington Town Council hereby accepts the resignation of Jay Slater from the Economic Development Commission as a member in accordance with email correspondence received by the town clerk dated September 7th, 2021. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Councilor Nagel. Any discussion on this one? All right, seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 
Aye. Aye. Thank you. Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Next item is refunds for September 14th, 2021. Deputy Mayor Bedrako. Resolved the property tax refunds in the amount of $21,293.44 are hereby approved in the individual amounts. And for those named on the request for refund of an overpayment of taxes certified by the revenue collector, a list of which is attached to this resolution. Second. Second by Council Camillo. Any discussion on this? I'll just say I saw that big long list and I checked it twice to make sure my name wasn't on there. I was hopeful. <laughs> all right. All those in favor say aye. 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 Council Braverman, you're on mute. Was there an aye there? Okay. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Next item is approval of the minutes of previous meetings from August 4th, 2021 special meeting and August 10th regular meeting minutes. I'm trying to, all right. Uh, who would like to make that motion? I move acceptance. Second. Okay. Motion made by Councilor Mankey, seconded by Councilor Camillo. Any discussion on those minutes? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Next item on our agenda is written and oral communications from the town manager, Mr. Chapman. Yes, I don't want to take a lot of time, but I just, I know that many of you have been out knocking on doors and people are inquiring as to the uh, paving operations of the town. I will tell you that we are uh, expanding significantly the number of streets and the mileage that are being done each year. This year alone, close to 30 different streets will be done, uh, which is about double what's been done in the past. But what we found once we went through the CIP and looked at this as a particular focus point is that we are fall we've been falling behind for many, many years uh, if you look down this chart, you'll see uh, on the line, we'll say 2019 or 2020-21, we've in the last uh, 20 years paved 60 miles of road. We should have paved 104 miles of road. These roads are designed to last 20 years. So uh, we only have paved 60 miles rather than 104 miles, which means for the next several years, at least, we're going to be playing catch up. So as you can see in the CIP distance column, uh, we are now looking at doing five or six uh, miles of road each year rather than uh, previous years where you were doing two or three, and in some cases, one mile of road. So um, we're doing a lot more streets, and there's going to be a lot more we'll say um, um, difficulty driving through the town while the milling and paving is going on. And I will tell you that just as of today, we intended to do all these streets this fall that are listed there. However, uh, Camp Avenue we've taken off because of the widening, the wide width of the road being a problem in the parking. And I'm gonna be sending out a letter very shortly to those residents to get their input as to what we should do or what they would like to see done. But um, these roads were all planned on being done this fall. However, we were just notified by our vendor, uh, paving vendor, that um, they have two crews that are now out because of COVID-19. So we are now going to have to uh, reduce down the number of streets to be milled and paved because we, we intended to mill everything and then pave everything. But uh, with the COVID-19 impacting on their staffing, uh, we're probably gonna mill about half these streets and pave them. And then next spring, probably do the other half. So it's not the way we planned it, but COVID impacts on a lot of people in a lot of ways. Uh, so we're gonna be making a full presentation. Hopefully if the leadership agrees, uh, October, the second Tuesday in October is gonna have the uh, streets program, 
the facilities and the public safety radio system and the ITs, uh, all of the issues that are contained within the CIP are gonna be on your agenda for discussion and presentation that night. So this will be one of them that'll be further, uh, uh, you know, further explained as to how we do determine which roads are to be done. And uh, I think it uh, probably is one of the most important evenings that you're gonna have an opportunity to learn about the CIP and how it's gonna be done in the future, which is significantly differ different than what has been done in the past. I'm open for any questions anybody has on it. I see Councilor Mackey. Yeah, we just point out that I spent some time watching one of your crews uh, do a road and I was impressed with the the teamwork and, and the, the care they took in making sure the road was 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 milled anyway uh, uh, appropriately. I just want to compliment your crews. They did they did a great job. Thank you. Councilor Minor. Thank you. Yeah, just some very positive feedback from residents that are seeing expanded road reconstruction projects. Uh, thank you for taking a look at Camp Avenue. That has been a, a narrow street for some time that just with cars parked can be a little challenging to get a fire truck down there. So thank you for at least reaching out to the residents to get their input and hopefully you can come up with a final solution on that. The question I've got and it has been posed to me several times recently and I just wanted to get a clarification from you was I've had several residents ask, you know, how is the project expanded so you know, greatly this year over the past. And the explanation I provided, and you can correct me if I'm wrong on it, was that we did not pursue a lot of paving projects for last year with the uncertainty of state funding and the additional uncertainty of what our tax base was going to look like on whether or not we were going to get our tax revenues as anticipated. Was that a good explanation on at least a portion of why we've doubled up? Keith. Yeah, it is, uh, Chris, and, and along with those reasons, um, we also have really looked at our operational costs for all departments, and we've reduced, as you know, uh, a number of staffing and so forth, and that money's been shifted over. We did have an increase in our revenue as a result of the referendum, uh, not the referendum, but the reval that had taken place. So uh, there's a combination of reasons, and, and certainly um, you know, this last two years have been very difficult to plan for because of COVID and so forth. But uh, we're comfortable that if we can do the six or six and a half miles a year going forward, that we will we will catch up and we will have all roads uh, in the town of Newington uh, without any potholes and so forth. Uh, it will take a number of years to get that accomplished, but th that is our goal. So um, you're right in all of the reasons that you've explained, as well as uh, the reval did help us uh, with revenue this year. So that's our plan going forward. And as you know, we, we increased the CIP plan. Uh, we doubled it this year as compared to previous years. So we're ha we have more funding to get more things done. Two final quick points. I think also part of it was, I believe there was some additional LOSIP funding that was provided from the state last year. Am I correct in that? That they were able to get some additional revenues back to us? Above yeah, I what believe, they yeah, I think there was a small amount of LOSIP money that was, uh, our LOSIP allocation, I believe, increased this year over last year. Uh, so yes, that, that is the portion of uh, how we're doing going forward, yes. Okay, and is there anything that's prohibiting us from I'm presuming it, it's either, you know, it's Tilcon either way on either the milling or the paving side. Is there anything that prohibits us from going off the state bid to one of the other state approved contractors that's in line for if they have crews available to help us try to finish out or do we just leave it till spring and just uh, I, that? I, I would say that because of COVID, I mean, the, the, the likelihood of any other vendor having the equipment and the manpower available and do it at the same cost that we are enjoying having Tilcon do it uh, probably is, is not realistic. I think that this COVID will be, you know, going through every operation that we depend on for all kinds of uh, services. So 
Uh, even if we lined ourselves up with an alternative to Tilcon today, uh, there's a good likelihood by, uh, by the end of the week, we probably have them telling us that their staffs are short now because of COVID. So uh, I, I'd rather be safe and do half of this list this fall and get the milling and paving done on that half and then uh, do the other half in the spring uh, to make sure that uh, we don't have streets that are milled out there that don't get repaved before the snow flies and then we're really in a jam. So I think we're gonna take the safer way uh, for the rest of this year. No, I, I agree with that. I don't want to road milled and left to that for winter. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And did we provide a request for proposal, or did we just piggyback off the state bid for our paving no, issue? We piggyback off the state bid. I don't think we get better pricing doing it ourselves. Agreed. Thank you. All right. Any other council comment or question on this one? Seeing none, we will move on to council liaison committee report. Wait a minute. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Yes, Deputy uh, Mayor Draco, go ahead. No, I wasn't sure whether Keith had any other items, um, but I do have a question for Keith, not related to the roads. Um, sure. I saw uh, yesterday Rocky Hill had a special meeting in the morning um, called by the mayor to um, result in a vote to get a petition process started. Um, to trying to pressure state lawmakers into holding a special legislative session at the Capitol. Um, Deputy Mayor Bedrako, I did receive a call from her indicating she was gonna be moving forward with that and would be looking for support from other towns. So that is something I would have to bring forward to you all. I hadn't had a chance to do that yet. Okay, well, I just wanna say that um, I do think it's very important, but she wants to get going on it pretty quickly. And she did indicate in this that several towns are joining the petition, including Wethersfield, Newington and Glastonbury. And, um, you know, it was, it's, they just came out today with that, with that carjacking and kidnapping of the 64 year old woman in Marlboro. That was not premeditated. It was a prime, crime of opportunity. Um, and they beat the crap out of her as well. Southington had six um, auto vehicle, I mean, thefts from auto vehicles this, in one week at a gas station in broad daylight. So um, I think this is important. And if we can join forces with her, and get that petition going as soon as possible to get a legislative a special session called. Um, so thank you. Yeah, I was. I haven't reviewed the language of the petition yet and I was gonna take a look at it. I had told her that at the surface that I was in favor of it and that I would bring it forward to the council. Um, so I will take a look at that and as soon as I can, it, I don't know if you have the language already but we can certainly look at that and consider whether it's um, appropriate to wait or call a special meeting to talk about that. As soon as you get the wording, if you can kind of send it out to us, maybe. Sure. Anyone else? Councilor Nagel? Uh, I believe we've moved on to council liaison committee reports. Yes. Yeah, I attended two meetings yesterday um, with the library. Uh, their uh, count, uh, their uh, board meeting, it was followed by their annual meeting important takeaways for uh, the public and the council to, to know about. Uh, the October 3rd race is on, it is continuing. If you want to enter or know anything, uh, want to know more about it, contact the library. Um, also during uh, both meetings, uh, the town librarian uh, described different innovative uh, ways in which uh, she's been uh, uh, serving the town and the public has uh, uh, appreciated it. Um, um, given the, the different elements of COVID that we've had in different red and orange levels. One of the most interesting one was outside browsing where they literally brought newer books outside the library. Uh, they had some from the library there so that uh, the public could do browsing outside when they couldn't do inside, especially of new materials. Um, at the annual meeting also most important was the, the librarian's uh, annual report uh, which described in great detail um, the workings and how the library has been uh, serving our town uh, despite the restrictions and finding new innovative ways of doing so, which he continues to do so. It was recommended at that meeting that uh, it's hoped that NCTV and or the town website um, have uh, uh, a place where people can, can view uh, at least uh, 
her presentation that was done at the annual meeting. It was done with pictures and illustrations and uh, uh, it very informative and in showing how innovative our staff and our library uh, uh, has been during the past year and a half and will continue to do so uh, no matter what uh, COVID may bring or any other circumstances. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Donahue. I have my yeah, I just uh, from an NCTV perspective, uh, we are meeting with uh, Vision Point, our vendor, and uh, Councilor uh, Braverman's microphone is on. Let me just mute it. Hold on, please. Thank you. And uh, so is a conference call on. I believe, Mayor Beth, you're invited to that if you want to attend and hear what's going on. Uh, final components to get the conference rooms up and running and then finish our studio work. Um, as far as uh, Dave, if the, as soon as they uh, get that over to us, we'll uh, get it on air for you. All right. Thank you. Councilor Bedrico. Um, yeah, I'm going to report on the TPZ um, meeting held last week. Um, they had a public hearing on 690 Cedar Street project, and it was unanimous, unanimously approved. And that project um, developer is Anthony Properties from Dallas, Texas. And the project approved was a four-story multifamily apartment building with 238 apartments, uh, a mix of studios, one, two, and three bedroom units with a four-level parking garage. It'll have two courtyards, a fitness center, a pool, and direct access to the fitness center, I mean, the fitness trail along the busway. And the developer's plan all along was to have them be all market rate, which is what they, um, what they built throughout the country. It's, it's a, a countrywide um, development projects that they have, but the state um, Department of Economic and Community Development because there were state funds attached to, you know, this, this, this is the former national welding site, because there were some state monies um, attached to the site, um, the Department of Economic Community Development requested an affordable housing component. So 5% of the units uh, for a period of 10 years will be designated as affordable housing. And that was agreed to by the state. Um, a traffic study was presented at that meeting. It was pretty um, informative. Um, and it concluded that this development of 238 apartments will generate 69 additional trips at the morning peak and 85 additional trips at the evening peak. Um, but one of the main presenters there was um, Brian Shu. He was the representative for Anthony Properties, which is the development. And uh, he said that this um, developer has 38 years of experience in the industry building class A multifamily communities. And they're a build and hold developer, meaning that they don't just build it and then try and sell it. They'd like to hold on to the properties. But I think what was interesting is he described, um, because they are nationwide, how they um, ended up here in Newington, because most of their projects are in the Midwest, but they felt there were a lot of opportunities um, in the Northeast. And um, they recently were able to find a project over in the greater Boston area. And they started looking for additional opportunities. So about 15 months ago, that's 15 months ago, they saw that the property was available. So Brian contacted Steve Kosaski and he came out here for a first look and he met with Keith Chapman and has been working on this project ever since. And um, I'd like to note that prior to that, there was absolutely no contact with Newington or anyone involved in economic development for Newington. So this is uh, kudos to Keith and his team for getting this um, project going. And the town planner and others on the TPC commented favorably on this um, because it's the development of an existing abandoned problematic site. Um, it's in line with our POCD and meets all the requirements of TOD expectations um, because TOD has to have some kind of um, housing component attached to it at some point. Um, and the big you know, kudos is that this project really meets Newington's vision of what it's going to be doing of its um, on TOD development. And it was Newington directed and kind of Newington initiative, uh, initiated instead of being influenced by you know, state or other um, regional agencies. So um, it should be a good project getting started. And um, I think you know, all uh, the uh, TPC members thought it would, um, it's gonna be a great addition to the town. Great. Thank you. 
Anyone else? All right, we'll move on now to public participation. Any member of the public can participate, participate by raising their hand in the Zoom window or star nine on your phone. All right, let me take a peek. We have first is Ms. Lyons. Hi, it's Rose Lyons, 46 Elton Drive. Um, just a couple of things, and these are only my opinions. You all seem to be surprised that there were any questions about what might happen to the Anna Reynolds committee, but I have not watched much, or I have not watched any of the meetings. There's just too much involved in getting onto Zoom that I don't do it, but I do watch Facebook. I do hear people talking about it in the public, but I think a lot of it can be attributed to the last minute attempts by some uh, of the committee members to try and second guess whether or not that should be renovated as new or whether it should be a new building. And if it was a new building, it would have stopped the project and we would have started all over. I've been watching this project get kicked down the road since prior to the town hall renovation. And I just think enough is enough. Stop making it a political football and just be done with it and let's get going and have a new or a new as renovate as new building for the children. Just my opinion. And when I asked questions regarding updates on economic development, I didn't mean to turn it into a uh, pointing fingers at who did it and who didn't do it. I've been watching 690 Cedar Street since it was national welding and went before the town council and there was big blow ups over whether or not to take money from the state or not because of the uh, conditions that we might have to follow. I watched the economic development director talk ad nauseum about what was coming and what wasn't coming. Um, I wanted to hear from someone who knew exactly what was going on. I wasn't going to take the word of people on Facebook or word of mouth, um, same way with the DOT projects. When I go into the Italian Gourmet and I'm told that the rotary at Fen Road is a done deal, it's dead, um, that it was never going to go anywhere and they knew that and they had just talked to someone at DOT and it was over, uh, I don't like listening to that in public with other people listening. I'd rather hear it at the table discussed by you. For um, it to turn into a political football all the way around the table tonight, I didn't like hearing what I was hearing about the panhandling. I know that there's uh, people on the Berlin Turnpike, and they do have their rights, but I, too, have my rights. I'd like to feel safe in my car. I don't think that uh, people are allowed to walk on the Berlin Turnpike. Maybe it's changed since I was younger. But in any case, um, there should be something that can be done. Uh, as far as I know, the state police haven't patrolled that area in many years. I could be way out of base, but I haven't seen a state trooper on that road in a long time. And um, as far as the pedestrians and so forth, they have new laws requiring the motor vehicle drivers to be more careful of the pedestrians. I... Um, would hope that maybe we could get some of those signs that Councillor Nagel has been looking for to perhaps make drivers aware that they don't get to turn on the red light when the pedestrians are crossing, especially in the center and by the senior center. Um, the personal jabs from one councillor to another at the table tonight, I think was uncalled for. Uh, when you are sitting there, address the issues, don't get it into a political back and forth. I see enough of that on Facebook. I can read it in your flyers. I can see it on Facebook. I can scroll by. Um, Ms. Lyons, I, appreciate, I do appreciate Thank your you. Thank you. I wasn't trying to cut I'm you off. I'm watching. I can see. Okay. <laughs> I wasn't trying to cut you off. I was just trying to let you know. No, you I know. I know. You've got things to do. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. All right, next um, is hold on one second. Uh, Diane. Hi, Diane Stam, 104 Steeplechase Drive, Newington, Connecticut. I want to thank all of you for tabling the building commission. I think uh, it does need a little bit more work. Um, I thank you for 
your understanding that the library is private property. So we'll need some well-defined representation, um, you know, just to make sure that during our collaborative build outs of the projects, uh, everybody's able to work together. So I'm looking forward to uh, working with the town council to try to figure out how we can um, find common ground there. And I appreciate that. Dave, you paid a lot of attention on our annual meeting yesterday. Thank you very much. Thank you for the plug to our race. Uh, one thing I will add is that the library's website does have uh, registration for the race on Saturday, October um, 3rd. And it is a two day uh, race packet pickup uh, due to COVID uh, registration. So everything will be outside and we're hoping that we can continue to um, have that outside with the with the rate. So uh, we're all looking forward to some yellow in those COVID, uh, COVID things. So again, I appreciate your time. Um, I'm a volunteer in town. I think it takes a lot of time. I know your volunteer jobs take even more time than mine. So I appreciate everyone's efforts in this. Thank you. Thank you. All right. And I see Eileen Francolino has her hand up as well. Ms. Francolino? Uh, Eileen Francolino, 116 Lydall Road. Um, I just had some concerns about the virtual meeting requirements. Um, first of all, I think you have to um, have some flexibility in those. I don't think they're ADA compliant. Um, those with visual difficulties may not be able to place their screen in the right place, or maybe they need a different kind of lighting. Um, and to set it in stone that it has to be one particular way seems to me to be wrong. Um, I also think that um, access to technology should be considered. Um, some people may not have access to uh, the type of technology where they can um, put their camera on. And finally, the, um, the area of appropriate dress. Um, I know that there was some concern about um, a committee member who showed up in his bathrobe after surgery because that's all that he could wear. So if now he has to have his camera on, um, he can no longer attend a meeting. He should at least be given the accommodation of being able to turn his camera off if he can't wear what you guys would consider to be appropriate dress. Um, and I think if we're going to set a standard about what appropriate dress is, we need to be a little specific because I know there are times when um, counselors come with t-shirts on them that have political slogans on them that some of us would find inappropriate. Um, and thank you for your hard work tonight. Thank you. Any other public? I'm just taking one last look. Oh, James, you're not public, but go ahead. Not public, but we don't really have a staff one. Um, I just want to remind the public, seeing as we have that um, ability right now, that we do have the shredding source coming up on the 25th. We'll be located in our new parking lot. Um, they can bring up to three boxes, banker boxes of materials, removing all metal from them. Uh, and we will be there from nine until 12 to be able to collect that material and pull it outside of our waste stream. In addition to that, um, starting tomorrow morning, we will be holding the um, municipal lottery to determine candidate placement on the ballot. That will take place at nine o'clock. And we will also have that uh, via Zoom. So if anybody wishes to view it, we do have it uh, listed on our website um, and they can just link in just like they do to every one of our normal meetings and be able to attend and watch that uh, process take place. Perfect, thank you. You're welcome. I hope everybody is able to show up. If not, you can watch it on our YouTube page. Okay. All right, I don't see any other hands up, so we will move on to remarks by counselors. All right, seeing not, Councillor Minor. I'm gonna make this very short and sweet. I wanna just be clear on one thing. I was not intending to trying to take away from the efforts by both Steve Kosofsky as well as Mr. Chapman on the solicitation for 690 Cedar. All I was trying to say, and this goes to multiple projects, is this project came to fruition through a combined effort of town staff, development opportunities that were presented by the cleanup efforts and demolition of the previous site from our previous economic development in our previous administration, 
all I'm trying to say is this is a cumulative effort that occurs sometimes over years before something comes to fruition. And if it weren't for the efforts of TPZ endorsing it, it would have gone nowhere and it would have been a dead issue. I am happy that it was accepted unanimously. I think it meets the needs of being in a TOD. And I am happy that now in 2021, we appear to be in a different situation. We were from, let's say, 2014, 15, where the community at large did not have an appetite for high density housing. Now, granted, the two proposals were different in terms of one being workforce housing and the other being market rate housing, but I'm glad to see both projects come forward to this point. So that's all I had to say. And I just would like to say that I don't think anybody at this table, either side wants to see anything other than the best for what we feel our residents deserve. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Mankey. Yeah, just to respond to Mrs. Franklino's comments, I, I wasn't intending to, to, actually the person I saw in a bathroom was someone who I worked with when I had a Zoom meeting to, to do a disciplinary meeting and her camera was on and she was in her bathroom. I just, I'm not saying anybody should, there's a reason for, for you not being addressed appropriately. That's fine, just, just let everybody know what it is. And what appropriate is, I guess, yeah, we have, I, I see people dressed inappropriately all the time um, or something that I wouldn't consider appropriate, but they might consider appropriate. So I think the, the point is, yeah, I think it should be something that, that uh, we probably could all agree that something we should, we should, uh, we would agree that it's appropriate as or not. But we probably kind of, kind of see it, but I wasn't intending to, to uh, single anybody out. My, my example is someone that, that I, when I was working, um, that I had had a meeting with and they were in their bathroom. Thank you. All right, seeing no other council comments, we will move now. The next item is to move into executive session. The matter is personnel, uh, subsection 1-206A for the town manager, purpose of the town manager's evaluation. Um, Mr. M Councilor Mankey, would you go ahead and read that in for us? Well, resolve, new into town council in accordance with Connecticut General Statute Section 1-206A hereby moves to go into executive session and invites the town council members and the mayor to discuss a personal issue, town manager evaluation. Second. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Councilor Camillo. I will say uh, that I would request that councilors, if they need to move to a private area where other people are not privy to hearing the discussion, um, that is what's necessary for an executive session. If you don't feel like you have that available or you do not have headphones that you could possibly use, um, then you should make a choice whether you're going to participate or not because this is a highly sensitive and confidential matter as is every executive session. Um, and it's imperative that we honor that confidentiality. Councilor Donahue. Uh, just a technical question, James, are we gonna adjourn from the executive session or are we coming back here? Um, we will handle it the way we normally do. I'll um, place the microphone near your meeting to allow you to make the adjournment. There's no action that's proposed after this meeting. So that's okay. Fine. So I just, I just want to be able to stop the recording and live broadcast. Correct. Yep. And you have all just received an email from me. That will be your invite into that meeting. Because there's no action proposed, we do not need to amend to the, the vote to extend, correct? Uh, correct. You've taken all your action. Adjournment is still allowed under your rules. Okay. Perfect. All right, folks, you have the uh, executive session link in your email. I will see you there in a couple of minutes. Correct. All, all right. right. So we have the motion and we have the second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. Any opposed? All right, motion passes and we will go into executive session. Thank you, everyone.
Sharon, we're in executive yes. session still. All right, go ahead. Yeah. All right, we are back in public session at 10.41. I will entertain a motion to adjourn. Take the motion to adjourn. Second. Second. Moved by Councilor Camilla, seconded by Councilor Annis. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? We stand adjourned at 1041. Thank you, everyone.